of the House Subcommittee on Information, Justice, and Transportation. Testifying before the committee, Ray Johnson, Executive Director of Criminal Justice Planning in California, and Deputy Attorney General Kathleen Kennedy Townsend. We hear first from the chairman of the committee, Democratic Representative Gary Condit of California. The program runs a little more than four hours. Uh, good morning. I would like to uh, begin today's uh, hearing by thanking all those who have assisted in putting this hearing together. I would also like to apologize uh, that we were not able to include more people on our witness list. Time would not, uh, would not permit it. Uh, for this reason, I would uh, ask for unanimous consent that the hearing record be kept open for 10 days so that anyone with uh, interest in this program can submit testimony. I also have uh, several letters, uh, both from uh, my district and around the country, that I would like to submit for the record. Uh, I would also ask the indulgence of uh, our witnesses today, if you could please summarize your statements and keep them uh, in the range of three to five minutes, it would be greatly appreciated. Today I would like to, um, to applaud President Clinton for the strong position he has taken uh, in the increasing uh, community policing and his commitment uh, he has shown to law, law enforcement and all the assistance that he has given them. Um, we would like to work with the administration to help craft a package of assistance uh, to the state and local law enforcement um, that uh, responds to both the President's plan and the concerns of those who will be testifying here today. It is certainly no secret uh, that the administration has proposed to eliminate the Burn Formula Grant program. Uh, in its place, locals will be offered a new program with community policing grants, more discretionary funds. Uh, I and uh, some of the um, members of this committee have concerns about this arrangement. For example, uh, how can we be sure that small communities will have the same access that they had before? Uh, what will become of the nearly uh, 1,000 task force that are funded by the BURN program. We, we have heard from dozens of law enforcement officials uh, from uh, all over the nation who have similar concerns. I have also heard from large cities that are concerned that they are getting shortchanged with the current system. Uh, I hope we can use today's hearing to take an opportunity to look at uh, any problems that exist in the BURN program and discuss ways to um, uh, ways that we can solve these problems. It seems to me that uh, the broad range, ranging flexibility in, uh, in Bern is consistent with the findings of the Vice President's National Performance Review. The NPR concluded that the President should empower communities by being committed to solutions that respect bottom-up initiatives rather than top-down requirements. I hope we can craft a package of law enforcement assistance that accomplishes this, and that is the purpose of this hearing today, to be constructive and try to find some solutions to the problems and answers to the, some of those um, questions and um, some of the concerns that the witnesses have today and people throughout this country. With that, I will turn to uh, Representative uh, Craig Thomas, our ranking minority member, for his statement and anything that he would like to submit to the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, do appreciate you calling this hearing today. Unfortunately, crime has taken the center stage, certainly, and more and more Americans are affected by the rising numbers and the rising incident of crime. Even rural areas have become more vulnerable to crimes, and drug and alcohol abuse. Juvenile crimes, in particular, are on the rise. President Clinton's proposal to take money away from rural areas is not a proper response. On the 25th of January, the President announced in his State of the Union address that reducing crime was one of the top priorities. This, his actions then, we hope, will match these words because uh, terminating the Burn Formula Grant Program is not the solution. This proposal is even more troublesome for rural communities because it transfers the money to programs specifically geared for urban areas. Our law enforcement officials know that what the problems are, and uh, they're telling us that flexibility is the key to combating violent crime and drug enforcement issues. And I have to tell you that those of us who come from small states and that have unique problems spend a great deal of our time, in, whether it's crime or whether it's health care or whether it's education, 
trying to make sure that the one-fits-all pattern of programs uh, is flexible enough so that we can deal with problems that are unique. And, of course, most people would agree with the notion that the local folks have a better idea of how those funds can be spent than, than do uh, people here in Washington. The Burn Formula Grant Program provides for flexibility the states need. It funds 21 various activities, ranging from reducing the demand for illegal drugs to improving our court and, and uh, prosecution systems. It's not up to me to decide what the states do with the money. That's the governor's responsibility. But I clearly believe these flexible grants are critical to states in view of the fact that 95 percent of the crimes committed are at the state level. Local folks need to be able to decide and adjust these funds to meet their changing needs. Mr. Chairman, if the administration's proposal is passed, Wyoming would stand to lose 1.7 million. Surrounding states with serious gang problems like Colorado would lose up to five and a half million. If administration wants to fight crime and drugs uh, and the use of drugs so that the citizens are safer, it must do it with successful programs like formula grants and reform the ones that don't work. Fighting crime is a serious problem and we need a real commitment, not just talk about it, especially uh, since drug use and crime is so closely linked. So like you, I hope we can find some, some useful areas here and, uh, and, and to and strengthen these programs. And I appreciate again the opportunity to be here and appreciate the witnesses that we'll have today. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Uh, uh, we are going to um, uh, get to the opening statements by the um, uh, committee in just a moment, but I must get to our first witness this morning. Uh, we're delighted to have uh, Mr. Wise, who's the former chairman of this committee and who um, trained me. <laughs> and uh, so you can blame him. <laughs> We're, uh, we're honored to have uh, Mr. Wise here, who is the former chairman of the subcommittee, and uh, Mr. Schiff, who is a uh, former uh, prosecutor from New Mexico, who was, I believe, the ranking member of this committee when you were the chair of the committee, uh, was scheduled to be here, could not make it because he had a uh, death in the family, and we give him our condolences, and uh, uh, he will have an opportunity to submit uh, testimony and uh, any other items he has for the record. So, uh, Mr. Wise, we appreciate you being here today. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I might note, I'm not sure who trained whom, because in the areas of agriculture and law enforcement particularly, you often led the, uh, led the subcommittee and we held hearings not only in your district but on issues that you brought to the committee's attention. Mr. Thomas, uh, it's good to be back with you and you make a very eloquent speech in front of, uh, in behalf of rural areas. Um, and you just also took out about uh, two-thirds of my remarks. Uh, Mr. Stupak, uh, oh, it's, it's a great subcommittee you're on. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and to participate in this program. And as soon as I leave, I will go to the budget committee where there is a caucus taking place in anticipation of the budget uh, being marked up short shortly. And I might add that one of the main items on the agenda is the criminal justice package. I do want to point out while I am here to express concerns about the Burn Formula Grant program and the fact that it would be removed under the Clinton proposal, the Clinton proposal also significantly increases crime-fighting efforts in many different areas, whether it's uh, cops on the street, whether it's prisons, whether it's uh, uh, legal assistance, new U.S. attorneys, uh, additional law enforcement personnel, and indeed some of the money from Burn is shifted to that and, and there are other uses that it will be put to. But in terms of a message coming through the budget, I think that the Clinton administration has put its money where its mouth is. Now we've, we're talking about the where does some of that money go and how is it allocated. In the case of the Byrne Formula Grant program, we have found that this does provide critical resources for local law enforcement that otherwise could not be funded. Uh, in the, I, I want to see existing programs at work. The formula grant program, I think, has worked. It's been a, and it can be a model for the administration's new anti-crime initiatives and should not be eliminated, eliminated. The Burn Formula Grants Program's flexibility administration are in keeping, I believe, with the Vice President's National Performance Review. The NPR concluded that the President should empower communities by being, and I quote, committed to solutions that respect bottom-up initiatives rather than top-down requirements, end of quote. The 21 broad programs in Bern uh, enable local law enforcement agencies to focus their resources on the toughest problems that they identify in their communities, whether it's combating violent crime, to drug control, to prison alternatives, and rehabilitation. This program is the largest federal crime-fighting resource for states, and I can attest that the grants are utilized by communities of all sizes. There are communities, for instance, in my district receiving grants of less than $1,000 
but these grants make a big difference. It makes a difference between whether you have a program like DARE or a neighborhood program assisting citizens to prevent crime. This program reaches communities that most need it and communities willing to make a commitment to the program. The Burn Formula Program requires that at least 25 percent of the cost of the program be paid with non-federal funds. And these funds ensure that communities have a vested interest in seeing these programs succeed. Yes, the most important aspect of the administration's crime package, I believe, is one having an additional 100,000 police officers on the beat. It is important to point out that the largest share, about one-third of the $1.4 million Burn Formula Grant funds in our state, were used to pay expenses related to multi-jurisdictional task forces in the past five years, and 57 percent of these funds were used to pay the salaries of those officers. Eliminating the burn program in some ways, we fear, would take police off the beat, uh, in theory, to fund putting them on the beat. And this doesn't make a whole lot of sense uh, to us. Now, I know the argument's going to be used that while the formula grant program is eliminated, the discretionary grant program is, I believe, almost double. There's a problem with that, and in fact, this subcommittee developed that uh, problem and, and discovered that problem uh, several years ago, and I would refer to the subcommittee's report of April, or transcript of hearings held April 18th, 24th, and May 24th of 1990, in which Jamie Alpert, who was then the gov director for the governor's office uh, uh, f uh, of uh, uh, criminal justice and highway safety, administered the burn grant program writes that one of the problems is, first of all, rural areas don't get discretionary grants in relation to urban areas, particularly more populous areas. But the second one, and I have not seen a change in this, is the where the funds go. And what the subcommittee found was that over one half of the discretionary funds were staying within the beltway. They were not getting out to local jurisdictions, but instead one agency would contract with another agency for the discretionary grant money. For instance, the FBI would contract or the DEA or someone would contract to do training programs for local law enforcement. Well, my feeling is perhaps one year, that's fine, but it should not then be a three to five to ten year program. Indeed, if, the, if that's a function of another agency, it ought to be included in their budget. So that in reality, I fear the discretionary money won't get to the folks that are losing out by losing the uh, burn monies. I would also like, if I might, Mr. Chairman, uh, ask permission to insert a number of letters into the record from various police agencies but um, uh, in West Virginia about what this would mean. But one in particular I'd like to call attention to is a letter from the Chief of Police of Charleston, West Virginia, Dallas Staples, uh, who ha writes that over the past five years, the Burn Memorial Program has provided the following assistance to the city of Charleston and the Charleston metro area. Uh, first, $184,000 was provided for the DARE program, Drug Abuse Resistance Education. Now, in the city of Charleston alone, this has enabled 6,000 school children annually to, to receive DARE instruction. I might point out, though, that Chief Staples has done far more than simply use this money in the city of Charleston. He has used this money to, under, to, to d underwrite the entire DARE s program statewide. And to date, and I've attended every one of the graduation ceremonies, to date 125 DARE officers across our rural state have been trained and are now in the school systems. Is it just DARE, or is it just federal funds doing this? No. Chief Staples and others go out and raise a lot of private money too. But cutting this money off, the burn money, would mean that DARE would not be able to function. I happen to think that DARE has been a very, very uh, important program and I'm concerned that uh, this contact, it does something else. It not only deals with drug abuse and teaching young school children about the problems of drugs, it permits them to see police officers in a different light than traditional law enforcement. Additionally, the uh, Chief Staples also points out several other It's been used uh, very adequate, very appropriately for a metro drug enforcement uh, network team in the city of Charleston and Kanawha County and other areas. I would just urge uh, the administration to reconsider this. I, my hope is that they'll, they'll be willing to be flexible on this. I, I think I can report to you uh, that in the Budget Committee there is great interest in including recommendation that there be more flexibility in the administration of this program, particularly so that some of the valuable programs previously underwritten by the Bo Byrne Formula Grant Program are not done away with. And so I would, I appreciate the subcommittee calling attention to this and I would hope that 
uh, between the subcommittee's efforts and working with the Department of Justice, we could uh, uh, re restore that flexibility that the BURN program provided, make sure that programs such as the Drug Abuse Resistance Education or DARE program are preserved for those um, areas that think that they're valuable and, and uh, uh, send a signal to our local law enforcement that we, we think they know how best to administer these funds. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wise. I certainly appreciate you being here, and I agree with your statement. Um, uh, we have uh, been uh, closely uh, working with the Judiciary Committee on this, and I hope that we could uh, urge uh, your assistance uh, uh, in working for a compromise that we all can agree upon. I, I know that you've, uh, uh, you've been very close to this issue, and, and I think uh, your efforts uh, uh, would go noticed, and we hope that maybe we can work together well, to come you. up with some solution on this. And I do appreciate you being here today. Mr. Thomas, do you have any questions for no, Mr. Wells? Thank you very much for being here, Bob. Mr. Stupak? No, sir. Mr. Horn? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. We thank you very, very much, much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> well, we will now um, ask uh, committee members if they have opening statements. I'll turn to Mr. Stupak, uh, who has been an active member of this. Uh, committee and uh, has been extremely interested in the uh, Justice Department uh, part of this committee and I'll ask if he has any opening statements that he'd like to make for the record. Thank you Mr. Chairman. Just a few brief uh, comments. Uh, Representative uh, Wise, Congressman Weiser sort of alluded to it that actually in, in the budget proposed by the administration there's actually 1.9 billion dollar increase. However with that uh, increased monies available it leads to new programs, new initiatives, new policies mm -hmm. Uh, actually more discretionary money, more cops on the street, something we all believe in. But at the same time, uh, some of the successful programs like the Burns uh, should, should fund should not, be, uh, should not be cut. I certainly hope that this committee and any recommendations we may or may not make, we do not become rigid in our thinking. Uh, law enforcement needs flexibility. That's why I believe in discretionary grants. This Burns uh, grant money is an excellent way of having flexibility for unique problems. Uh, having been a former city police officer, having been a state trooper, uh, having worked in the Michigan legislature where we fought to save funding for our multi-jurisdictional teams, we needed flexibility. And as long as we had greater flexibility, I think more successful the programs were. And I think the burn fund certainly allowed us to have that flexibility. Uh, but I look forward to uh, working cooperatively with uh, this committee and of course the budget committee and trying to get these funds restored. Um, and as we work together, not only do we have uh, a lot of help with uh, these drug teams, the multi-jurisdictional drug teams, as, as we're going to hear about today, but it leads to greater cooperation, not just in combating drugs, uh, but it leads to other things. Like when we had the methcathadone problem coming up in northern Michigan, where we passed legislation earlier this year, uh, we actually got a handle on a serious drug problem before it became a nationwide drug problem. And I think it was the cooperative working relationship with the law enforcement agencies that led to that. And again, funding from this burn fund that really helped us out. I'm looking forward to our uh, expert witnesses today. Uh, Ardeth Defoe from Michigan will be to testify. I look forward to her testimony, worked with her in the state legislature. And also, uh, it's good to see uh, Tom Pagel, who's from Wyoming, Mr. Chairman. But uh, I'll tell you right now, he's really from Michigan. Uh, we worked together when we were state troopers and uh, look forward to hearing his testimony. So I think we got an excellent lineup today. Look forward to working and getting this problem resolved. And let's keep flexibility the, the key word, not only on this committee and our thinking, but also for the dedicated law enforcement officials and the people who are testifying today. They need the flexibility to do the job. Thank you, Mr. Stupak. Uh, we have another uh, uh, member who has uh, worked very hard in, uh, on the committee and in this particular area. Uh, Mr. Horn, my colleague from California. Mr. Horn? Thank you very much. You might pull that mic. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm looking forward to this hearing with interest. I think nothing is more important than, one, helping the localities in this country uh, solve some of the absolutely almost unsolvable crime problems that have hit, commu hit communities all over the country and secondly, to provide in any federal program that there is sufficient local discretion. So I would hope we would look at this program and if it's been successful in providing that discretion, continue it. Uh, if it can be uh, merged with others that give the local people who know their own problems better than anybody in Washington knows their problems, the flexibility to move money around, I think we ought to do that. 
Thank you, Mr. Horn. Uh, we will begin with um, uh, panel two, and I'm going to um, uh, ask our, our colleague to introduce our next witness, uh, Mr. Kennedy. Well, this is, a, this is a very, very difficult task. I don't know exactly what to say about this w next, next witness, although I, I, I hesitate to think of where she got her training in dealing with the criminal element in this country. But <laughs> in, in any event, I, I would like to just uh, take this opportunity to introduce uh, Kathleen uh, Kennedy Townsend. Uh, uh, Kathleen, uh, you, you're not allowed to come up and sit down at the table, yeah, Kathy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In any event, I, I do. Uh, Kathleen has actually uh, uh, was a uh, uh, an attorney and and that, uh, graduated the top of her class at uh, at Radcliffe and and has gone on and made a tremendous uh, contribution uh, to our country in the uh, in the. Uh, programs that she implemented uh, dealing with criminal justice issues and issues involving getting uh, our nation's youth uh, a sense of uh, responsibility and, and uh, uh, their moral responsibilities to our country and to their local community. I think uh, her work in the state of Maryland uh, has been second to none. Uh, President Clinton has, uh, has uh, visited the programs that she has set up and uh, has uh, touted them as a national model throughout the country. I think she's uh, excellently suited toward uh, dealing with the community-based programs, and I know that there are many controversies, Mr. Chairman, that you and members of the committee are having to deal with with regard to uh, law enforcement dollars and where those dollars uh, ought to be best spent. But I think Kathleen's uh, experience will, will be uh, uh, tremendous in terms of uh, helping our country sort uh, through those priorities, and I, I very much want to welcome her here this morning and look forward to working with you and members of the committee as well as uh, Ms. Townsend uh, in, in the future. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Kennedy. We appreciate you coming over and making the introduction. That, that's very, very nice. Uh, we have a policy, Ms. Townsend, of uh, swearing witnesses in. Do you mind uh, no, like all of you and your assistant standing? Yes, and can we I introduce uh, Grace McDally sure. um, to the Office of Policy? Do we stand up? Yes. The Office of Policy Deve Development and Jack Nadel, who is the acting director of BJA. Please raise your right hand. I swear to tell the truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. I do. Thank you. Record indicator, everyone said I do. Ms. Townsend, welcome. We're delighted to have you here. Ms. Townsend is the Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the uh, Office of Justice Programs, and we're delighted to have you here. It's good to be here today. Uh, thank you for allowing me to talk about the administration's um, crime control initiatives, what we plan to do in this administration. Um, you've heard about it before, and I'm glad that you uh, approve of what President Clinton wants to do. Uh, the problem of crime is, is very serious. Um, We've seen it all over our country. We've seen it certainly in rural areas. We've seen it in our cities. And I think there's no doubt that we want to make our streets and neighborhoods safe wherever they be. The administration has a broad plan uh, to address the crime problem. Uh, it starts with the Brady Bill, which many of you helped pass last, uh, last year. It also includes the 100,000 police officers, boot camps, drug treatment for hardcore and crime, it committing addicts, a ban on the sale of manufacturing military assault weapons, provisions to keep guns away from kids, expansion of the federal death penalty, and a safe schools program to combat crime, violence, drugs in our schools. Eight percent of kids miss one day a school a month because they're afraid to go there. That is unacceptable, and I think it's unacceptable to you, and it's certainly unacceptable to the administration. We've made crime fighting a priority and we're putting substantial funds beyond, behind that commitment. Uh, this year, as you know, in the President's budget, there's $2.4 billion for such things as community policing, boot camps, drug courts, drug treatment. We're also doubling, as you heard earlier, the amount of the uh, Burn Grant discretionary funds to $100 million. We've sought um, an increase of money for the Office of Victims Crime, 21 million, and an additional 69 million for juveniles, so we can give them treatment, prevention, help. We're also um, getting 16 million dollars from the Asset Forfeiture Fund for uh, police overtime. Altogether, this is a 325 percent increase in the amount of money that will be available for crime fighting over current levels, 325 percent. I think that we should underline that, because we're just talking about so much more money. And we're certainly going to be able to. I know there was a lot of 
questions as to whether this can go to rural areas, but certainly it can. The, the crux, the under of this whole program, of course, is community policing. The idea that, that police officers working in conjunction with the citizens can solve problems, not just police by themselves, but working with the citizens. That's really what stops it, Help getting citizens to identify the issues. Are there crack houses? Are there abandoned cars? Are there people who, uh, oftentimes, as you know, in Washington, D.C., uh, people are afraid to testify because they don't trust the police. Well, with, if you, with a good community policing program, you can get people to go and testify against the people who cause problems so that you can really make a difference, put criminals in jail. Um, but I know that you asked for this hearing because you were disturbed about the cuts in the burn grant proposal. Um, I, I, I understand, and you've said it so eloquently, that the Burn Grant has certainly done a good job. It's funded many worthy programs. But the fact of the matter is that in this new administration's program, we're going to fund a lot of those programs. Uh, criminal records upgrade, for, for instance. Under the regular Burn Grant, it was $16 million. Under the, the, um, under the bu budget proposal, it'll be $100 million. That's an increase of almost 400%. Uh, in addition, um, we're going to be putting so much additional money into community policing. I know you were worried about Wyoming, for instance. You said uh, that will be a loss of $1.4 million. But under the House-passed um, crime bill, which hasn't quite passed <laughs> all the way yet, but what you, what you proposed, you're going to get about $4.5 million. So in other words, the police in Wyoming will, able, will get money, and they'll be able to decide how best to use that. What are the programs they need to do? How are they going to help people? So I think, you know, there's always going to be, you know, when people change the way there's a funding stream, there are always going to be questions. But the fact is the administration is really committed to working with you, to helping police officers, and we're really putting serious money behind this. And I think that it will help the rural states. One other just a story, because I know you keep asking these questions. Um, we had a $150 million supplement, which the Attorney General announced last year. Um, we've given out already $75 million, 38 uh, and 108 grants. 38 of those grants went to communities under 25,000. So the fact is that when a rural community has a problem and can describe that we in the Justice Department want to help, and we will, and we can give them money, and that's only with half the, half the grants. Um, I'd, I know that you have plenty of questions, and I'd love to answer them. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, do either of your assistants have um, comments they'd like to make, Ms. Townsend? I think... Would you like okay. to say something? Say, just to reaffirm um, what Kathleen said, we believe that the administration's proposed programs, in fact, combine targeting and flexibility in a fashion which will allow an enormous amount of local discretion while affecting priority programs and the administration and that you will in fact probably see a significant increase. Um, <coughs> Kathleen's example was from the uh, House pass policing bill but you'll note that the Senate version in fact um, is $8.9 billion for policing, and under the Senate formula, that alone would come to uh, approximately $54 million for policing purposes for each state. Under the House version, it would be a lower level, but I would assume in conference you'll have some, and the administration supports the full funding of that initiative. Um, so you're, you're talking about funds which, while targeted to administration priorities, may in fact, if there is a program currently funded under the Burn Formula program, you might, through the displacement of funds, the increased availability of targeted federal assistance, might be able to have state and local funds support any program, and I'm not sure that there's one that exists, which is not um, going to be directly funded under the administration's proposed programs. Um, so I would keep in mind the potential of, of displacement of some funds, um, increasing local discretion. Thank you. Mr. Nadal? Thank you. I'll wait for the question. Thank okay. You. I know these names are not right, so we might want to switch them around. Um, I would like to introduce, uh, for the record, uh, correspondence between uh, 
the drug czar Lee Brown and the Attorney General uh, Reno. Uh, in this letter, um, uh, Mr. Brown raised objections to cutting the Byrne grant. Um, in the end, uh, the program ended up getting eliminated and um, not cut, but eliminated. And I'd like maybe you can give us some idea how that decision was made, why Mr. Brown was overruled. Well, he was, um, he was disturbed. I think it was a misunderstanding, um, which is that when the Byrne Grant, uh, there was an original proposal to cut the Byrne Grant in order to uh, spend that money on juvenile justice prevention. Um, as you know, there's been an incredible increase in the number of young people getting involved in crime. And the Byrne Grant has 22 different areas, and it's a broad spectrum. And uh, the Attorney General thought, I think with good reason, that you know we've got to we, we've got to concentrate our issues on pro, on on the areas that are most in need, and concentrating on juvenile crime uh, was something that really needed to be done. And so it was really switching the money from the burn grant to uh, uh, juvenile justice. So the misunderstanding is what is that that I didn't think he he didn't understand that the money wasn't being taken out of uh, criminal justice programs entirely. He thought, he, he thought that's what was happening. He didn't understand it was being switched to the juvenile justice um, section. Have you done uh, any analysis on how many Washington-based full-time employees it will take to administer all the new discretionary spending and community policing grants contained in the budget request? We, we've, um, uh, OMB has done it. It, it, it will be, subs it will be uh, approximately uh, uh, 300 more uh, people. 300 more people. Are um, are sm all small? All sm but that you know, that's when you're increasing a budget by 2.7 billion dollars. Obviously, we need some more help in in uh, are figuring you? out how that should be. You know, in in distributing that money. Are uh, small jurisdictions uh, regular participants in the uh, uh, burn discretionary program? Are small jurisdictions? Sure. Yes. So I mean, you know that. How, how do you propose to continue funding for um, for the uh, 100 or so task force that are currently funded through well, this Well, I program? think, the, the, as you know, that when the Byrne Grant was originally um, uh, passed, the idea was that the Byrne Grant would last for four years. It was not supposed to be, a, uh, it was supposed to help jurisdictions decide, you know, Oh, this might be an interesting program. Let's try this and try something new. It was never exp it was never intended to be a continual grant of money to the states for uh, a single program. Now that's been extended for a couple of years uh, for task forces. But I think that the the question will be: Do the states continue to, to think this is important? If they do, um, some of that money can be uh, some of that will be picked up the state as as was intended originally by Congress when they passed the Byrne Grant formula. So, so what you're saying, the task force, uh, the cost of those, if, if it's uh, the judgment of local jurisdictions in the state, they'll pick up the funding for it. If, if it is, there are, as you know, also t um, some task forces funded by the FBI and the DEA. Um, we've found uh, that some, there's a, because there are so many task forces, you, you noted yourself, there are over 800 task forces, that there's sometimes a re uh, you know, repetition. Repeti not repetition. Replication. Re replication. Thank in, you, In Grace. fact, as I think a number of the members, including yourself of, of this committee, are aware, the um, issue of task forces and working to make federally assisted task forces, whether they be fu federally funded or task forces in which fe um, federal prosecutors and agents work with local and state law enforcement has been a very high priority of the Attorney General. Um, her experiences in Florida and elsewhere led her to believe that this is something that we need to look at and to work very closely with states and local agencies to make sure that all of the federal dollars are being cost effectively spent, which is not to say that task forces are not a central piece of the administration's law enforcement policy. Uh, and uh, many of the initiatives, but is, is to say that one of the areas where the department is working with other federal agencies and state and local agencies very closely is to make sure that duplication, um, overlapping, we do not want competition between task forces in the same jurisdiction um, from with different sources of federal funding to be working against each other. Um, so making sure that they 
uh, federally assisted task forces are as cost effective and efficient and as well coordinated as possible is one of Attorney General Reno's top priorities and I expect that you'll be hearing more on her efforts in this area. Let, let me give you, let me try uh, in a layman's term, give you my example of task force and, and how you intend to fill this gap if this is eliminated. You have a rural county um, and it has uh, 20 some small cities, maybe a couple small cities uh, in that group or large cities in that group. You may have cities 4,000, 6,000 have no money to participate in the task force. But what they benefit from is um, the larger cities all coming together and sharing the expertise into the small city. Um, what happens, at least in California, and, and I'm probably around the country, is that when you clamp down, as you know, in the larger metropolitans, at, at least in the drug area, people disperse and go into rural California and probably rural America because there are limited resources there. Uh, it doesn't mean that, that the police departments aren't sophisticated. You may have three police officers and the bad guys locate in that community believing that they can get away with it because there's just not the wherewithal to deal with them. So the benefit is, is when that move takes place, the task force shifts into rural California, rural America, and they come down on the bad guys and they do a, a reasonably effective job, I believe, at least in the Central Valley of California where I have some knowledge about this. How do you intend to replace that if that is missing? Well, to respond in part, um, it is not clear, if you're saying that in your hypothetical, um, all of the task force uh, assistance comes from formula burn grants. Um, there are a number of ways in which it would be replaced, but it's also, and just yesterday, uh, or was it the day before, the Attorney General announced the uh, administration's National Violent Crime Initiative, which in fact is intended to help communities. I know there are some within your own district which are experiencing problems with gang violence and drug-related gang violence to provide assistance in a variety of forms, um, including working with and trying to better coordinate the existing resources supporting state and local task forces uh, to, to really to integrate the federal effort the dollar assistance, the money which may be available from asset forfeiture for overtime to assist in state and local task forces, the community policing initiative. Um, again, I believe you, one of the cities in your district had an excellent and funded in one of the early rounds of the police hiring program they did. With, for gang initiatives. That's precisely the kind of effort coordinated on a wider scale within, the, within areas so that the the problem using federal assistance on intelligence and otherwise isn't just shoved around from one by one task force to another area in the jurisdiction, but that the effort is to address it and to prevent it from being moved further, to make um, the rural areas inhospitable to, um, to gangs that might otherwise just move in because they see less law enforcement or a, a softer area. Um, th this, is, this is something that in, has had the Attorney General's personal attention in trying to make the pieces of the administration's program fit together to avoid precisely the problem you described. I, I believe that, and, and I only raise this in layman terms because I'm trying to make sure that we all understand what we're talking about and, and, and the witnesses and people who are concerned about this need to have, have this answer. The concern I have is if, if we can't fill the void, if, if the task force is uh, funded by the burn grant or a high percentage of it is, I, I know that local communities where I live have to participate in some financial way, and, and they do, and it's reasonable because they're, they're, sharing, um, they're, they're sharing expertise with other people. But if it's up to California to pick up the cost, uh, it's, it's going to be slim pickings for them because, I mean, they're already uh, strapped financially, and I would uh, risk to say that, that most of the states up here uh, probably going to share the same experience, and that's my concern. If the task force is effective and they're doing a good job, and you leave it up to state to pick up uh, the federal cost, it, we have problems. And so that's why I asked the question: If we're going to pick up the void some way? I, I think that the, you'll see that there are a number of initiatives, including those which the administration is working on and hoping to work on in conference in the crime bill, that are intended to specifically address the problem that you identified. 
Well, well, well will, they, will, the, will the new program have some, uh, will cause interruption into the existing pro, uh, funding? I mean, will they, I mean, will the existing funding, how, how will the existing funding be picked up besides states? I mean, are they going to be able to just continue on with the programs and apply for this funding with those programs, with, with the existing programs? I'm not sure. The task force right now, right. does it get to apply for uh, the same kind of funding under the new program? It would not necessarily be the same kind of funding. Um, the the consortium of, of communities um, or, or joint jurisdictions might very well have to um, put together a proposal that addresses precisely you know, how they intend to address this, this problem, how the resources are going to be used. It, it's, it's difficult to answer your question without having final legislative language enacted. I understand. Okay, I, I'm not going to... That's the, the goal is to make sure that it is where the task forces are effective, that there will be support for them in, you know, a, if anything, a more comprehensive fashion. I, I believe that that's, that is the goal, I mean, is to not have interruption and for us to continue doing a good job if we're doing a good job. So I, I'm not going to occupy all the time. I do want to uh, um, allow the other uh, committee people to ask questions for Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for testifying. I, let me just say that, uh, you know, in these kinds of issues, we often get off in these eloquent speeches about <coughs> anti-crime. Everyone's opposed to crime. That's not the issue before us. The issue is how do we deal with states that have unique, uh, unique problems. Uh, you mentioned in your statement somewhere that uh, communities under 150,000 are small communities. Let me tell you, we don't have any of 150,000 in Wyoming. 60 is the largest we have. So those are the kind of unique things that we have. So I hope that uh, we, can, we can talk about that. You mentioned this was a four-year program. Uh, then you also mentioned in your statement that you're going to continue programs that work well. This, which ones work well? Does this work well? The community policing? Mm -hmm. No, not community policing, this burn grant. Um, the, formula the formula grant, as you know, is 22 different subject areas, and um, it's been in, in existence for a number of years. And I think the experience under the Burn Grant is that we've discovered that there are parts that work well. Community policing, for instance, in which people work in their communities. Um, uh, juvenile justice prevention, that that's really one of the great sources of crime. So let's put some more money in that. That's possible let under the Burn Grant, isn't it? Right, but let's put it under the juvenile justice. The idea is that there are, we're going to try to target, you know, where we should spend our money. This is, a, as you know, ex tough fiscal times. And the question is, do we target our money? Do we make sure that it's being used in those best programs? And uh, Who do you think has the best chance of deciding what's best in Wyoming? I think the local communities do. And that's what's so exciting about the way that it's going forward. I, I just want to, I don't know if you, um, let me just reiterate what, something I said earlier. Of the $75 million that have, uh, has already been given out through the police hiring supplement, um, 108 grants were given. 34 of those grants went to communities under 25,000. So it wasn't just under 150,000, it was under 25. Yeah. And the idea is, it's, you know, and we've had over 2,700 applications for over 13,000 police officers. Um, those communities now can apply and describe the issues in their community. And therefore, they can, they can receive the money. So I think a local community who puts together uh, an idea, we need police officers, we, 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 uh, we can use them well, we can work with the community, they can get the money. Sure. Um, I'm not making my point very well, I guess. Uh, well, that maybe I'm not program listening. has Sorry. worked. Yes. Has worked. Police on the street is not something you need in Basin, Wyoming. You know, it's not like walking the street in New York City. Well, do, you un do you understand? Yeah, I do. I guess what community policing doesn't say walking, as we understand it, community policing is the idea is the community can best decide. Um, as That's can why I, we're here. Yeah. yeah. And, the, and the community, for instance, under um, uh, both the Senate and the House version, every state is going to get a bottom line amount of money, mm -hmm. it, ranging, you know, perhaps could be four 
times could be more if the Senate bill ver version passes, four, four times as much money to Wyoming than they currently get under the Byrne Grant. So they, I think that the towns and cities of Wyoming will have a great say and ideas about how best um, they could read the city. For instance, as Jack Nadel has just pointed out to me, Casper, Wyoming has received $450,000 under the police hiring supplement, which is only $150 million. Um, and that's one-third about the amount of the, the Byrne Grant. <laughs> so and the Byrne Grant, interestingly enough, you announced today. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But I, I mean... I, the, that's today? They always come out on March the 1st? I think that award was made some time ago. Uh, oh, what's, we just got two. the news release today. It was, in the yeah. it was around two, but yeah. we hold it up for 10 days. How are you going to fund the burn grants? The burn grants, made? right now, the burn grants are now, you know, we're in fiscal year 1994. But you agree with not having them in 95? Yes, that's the administration's policies that it, the yeah. best way to help local okay. jurisdictions is through the community, these other. And the administration is in support of the Senate bill? Uh, no, the, the the administration is hope is working closely with both the uh, the Senate has acted um, is working closely with um, House Judiciary and will be um, working with conference to resolve the differences in conference to resolve the differences between the House and Senate bills. Um, what is your position? Do you have a bill? There is not an independent um, administration crime bill. Um, there are a number of portions of, of both some of the House passed bills and the Senate passed comprehensive crime bill, which the administration strongly supports, which were outlined in Kathleen's um, opening statement. Yeah. There are, are issues being resolved in both the reconciliation process and there are a number of, of issues that are still under consideration in House Judiciary Committee. Um, so the initiative you spoke of is depends on what comes out of the Congress. Oh, yes, yes. 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 But, but perha perhaps I can, can help a little. Oh, I'd uh, like that, Grace. <laughs> um, and, and that is to say that there are num it's not just the community policing police hiring program that we're speaking about when we're talking about the, the overall administration initiative. Um, it, is, it includes the uh, assistance that we expect to come out of conference in terms of gang prevention, the juvenile justice programs, drug courts, um, perhaps in, in many jurisdictions, um, most importantly, assistance for correctional and detention facilities. Um, and there, there is an effort on the part of the administration to look at where the gaps and the problems in the criminal justice system are um, nationwide and to target and focus assistance on those issues while at the same time allowing the flexibility and a substantial amount of discretion within the programs to address That's local initiatives and pretty problems. pretty easy to say, uh, uh, isn't it? it? But it isn't easy to do, is it? If you have, if you're focusing on something, you said you're focusing on the, the Attorney General on coordination. I met with the law enforcement folks in Cheyenne. Uh, all the way from the FBI and the Secret Service, the DCI, all the way down to the Chief of Police in Cheyenne. And the one thing that they felt good about more than anything was the coordination that they have there. And I, I think that's what this is all about, is making as certain as we can that, that uh, the states and communities are able to reflect the differences that they have and frankly, the Attorney General has uh, an experience in Dade County, Florida, but not in right. Bighorn County, Wyoming. And I guess if I can make any point, and I'm sure you understand it, but I don't sure, I'm not sure you accept it, is that I don't think the Attorney General ought to be telling us how we do these things. And that has been the beauty of these kinds of grants. And as I read your statement, as I, as I see that you're going to do what works the best, what you think works the best, you're going to have cops on the street, which you think works the best, then I'm very leery. I mean, we, we've had a little experience uh, with the feds telling folks how to do things. Specifically, let me tell you that the money that was spent in drugs in Wyoming had to be for intravenous drug users. We had two. <laughs> so, you know, that's an experience that we don't want to go through again. And uh, so I, I, I'm maybe a little strident about this, but I feel very strongly about it. 
that we have folks that are very capable, very able, and that are able to deal with the issues as, as they exist. And I really am reluctant to have you folks inject yourselves you know, entirely into what we ought to be doing. The Attorney General probably could not agree with you more in terms Good. of the need for the problem identification to be bottom up. As you know, although her, she was in a metropolitan area, she experienced more than one um, frustration with being um, hearing, I'm here from Washington and here to tell you what you need to do and how to do it. Um, coordination, working closely with the state and local officials, as well as with others within the community, is you know, overarching in, in not just crime control, but across the board, mm -hmm. one of the most important things to her. And to make it easier for local officials and communities to work with the federal government by having better integration of programs and services at the federal level, using the people that are on the ground um, in each district to help run interference with the bureaucracy in, in Washington is part of, of her overarching goal. She would not, I mean, there's a wide range of programs. There are a number of the discretionary grant programs which may not be appropriate for jurisdictions within your district. Mm -hmm. But it's her hope that there also will be a number that will give your districts precisely the assistance they need. Whether Even in the police, the, the community policing, police hiring, 85% of those funds are targeted at hiring. 15% are for other purposes relating to assisting communities in improving their policing I understand, activities. And I like what you're saying. The chief of police said, Brady Bill's wonderful. It took a cop off the street so he can do the administrative work. It didn't, wasn't what we wanted. And I know you're not totally responsible for it, as enthusiastic as you are about it. Uh, well, I'm not. But um, in any event, I like what you're saying. I hope that turns out to be the case. And uh, I've made my point. We'll do our best Thank to make sure it is. Thank you for your comments. And Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Mr. Dupac. Thank you. Of these uh, 108 grants that have been let already, how many were for uh, drug task force or drug interdiction teams? They were, they were all for community policing. Okay. Hiring. A, a number of the, as you may know, a number of the, the applications um, specified the problems in the community that they intended to address. So, in fact, in the chairman's uh, district, one of the, um, I, was it Merced, I believe, um, had a proposal that wanted to use a community policing approach to deal with an extremely ethnically diverse community to deal with both gang and drug problems in that community. And it was, was custom tailored to use a community policing approach combined with more traditional policing to address the problem in his community. Um, I could not tell you precisely how many of the, of the grants awarded had um, similar proposals but those that thought drugs were a significant part of their crime problem um, addressed and included a strategy for addressing that problem in the district. Well, what my question was for drug task force, undercover drug work, zero, right? That's the answer of the 108, none. I, I would hesitate to say zero because some of it may have included that as a component, but it was not to fund it. The okay. If you go with your proposal, the administration's proposal, where will the states get these formula grant funds to help fund drug task force, drug undercover operations? Where would they get it underneath your proposal? Where can we look? Well, part of it, um, as you know, they, there's a hundred million dollars for uh, discretionary grants. And so um, they can certainly apply for the money under dis discretionary grants. Um, and there's actually, you know, there's a hundred million dollars. And if that's where they need it, and then that's a uh, top priority for them. And uh, a hundred million, if you go back to the 1993 statistics that we have, right. we received this um, more than that from the federal government. We received well over 
that hundred million. So where would we look to just to try to maintain the task force well, we have? Just I think if you um, of the of the twenty, this is my understanding of the twenty went to d different district areas. About a hundred million, maybe a little more, was used for drug task forces. The rest were used for other uh, parts of the of the uh, criminal justice system, um, community policing. Uh, victims, uh, juvenile justice. So all of the burn grant money, as it's currently given right now, doesn't go to task forces. One per, a, Agreed. A, a percentage Agreed. of it. But my point is, yes. we need the money for the task force, for the drug. Uh, I mean, in the burn grant, I believe in community policing. Right. I wrote the first community policing law in Michigan. Right. I believe in it. Right. I support it. Juvenile crime, we have to do something with. But at the same time, let us not forget the drug task force. I don't think anybody wants to forget the drug task force. I then mean, where is it going to be found on the burn grants? It's, it's, where? It, it, it is not going to be a specific line item in the burn grants. It is an eligible funding purpose under the discretionary portion of the burn grants. It's also a primary purpose for assistance under several other programs. And it's something that has quite successfully um, been supported including in some uh, jurisdictions within your district using the asset forfeiture funds and equitable sharing. The other issue which I've mentioned briefly in the past is to the extent that there is a gap in the direct assistance, we would anticipate that the large increase in funding for other purposes, including some things which I'm sure cities like Detroit and other uh, jurisdictions in, in Michigan are currently directing their funds to could be shifted to fill any gap that formula funds currently are funding while the federal assistance supports a program that might otherwise be covered by the state or, or local funds. Um, it, it, it's, it's not perfect. Um, but the state and local task forces continue to be a priority, and there is assistance available for them. Where? I, I mean, you, you take away our primary source of funding, the burn formula grants. You take it away. Where do we look? And my district isn't even close to Detroit. I am so far north. Uh, I, I mean, my district is very remote. My biggest town is 20,000 people. And I have... Uh, 27,000 square miles, so my area is very remote, and we have a very unique drug problem called methcathinone. Mm -hmm. Where do we look for assistance from the federal government to help us fight the methcathinone problem, which is becoming a nationwide problem? If, if you take away this funding, as proposed, where do we look? That's I'm what I need to know. Say, well, perhaps that rather than giving you generic answers based on what we expect to have available, um, we can give you a response on how we think that problem can best be addressed in writing, if that would be helpful to you. Because I don't think any of us are expert in um, precisely how DEA and the other law enforcement agencies are dealing with that um, specific problem, which is in fact, as you noted, a, an increasing problem that we're trying to prevent from spreading elsewhere. Okay, take methcathinone away. Let's go to cocaine. If you don't have the burn grant funds, how do we get federal assistance to do our undercover teams? How do we do that? I, I tried to answer that question before identifying the availability of discretionary funds under the burn discretionary grant program, asset forfeiture equitable sharing, the existing DEA state and local task forces, um, and potentially under other programs that are the, gangs program, the, 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 the youth gangs program, a number of the, those that are targeted at drugs and violence. Are, are you saying then we can apply for, for youth gang money and divert it then to drug undercover teams? If as part of the strategy for addressing, I, and I don't know enough of the details about the problem of, of cocaine in your district, um, but there are a number of avenues for addressing it that may be supported by a number of the proposed and existing initiatives. Can, can I, uh, Jack Nadel, who's the acting director? I don't know if I'm going to satisfy you. Uh, we're doing, we've done some surveys of uh, task forces, and uh, we found about 800 task forces funded under the uh, 
burn program. FBI funds about a hundred and some task forces working with state and local government. DEA funds another equivalent amount. We fund another 40 or so under our discretionary program. And uh, what, what's indicated in some jurisdictions, we found uh, state task forces or local, excuse me, local task forces that don't even know that there's a DEA or FBI or a task force working in the same area. So we found a lot of duplication overlap. But worse than a duplication and overlap, because there's enough crime out there for everybody, what we found was a failure to sh uh, share intelligence information. So you can have one task force that's working clearly with burn subgrant money, if I can use that term, who's not sharing intelligence information with DEA, FBI, or with our other discretionary programs. What we're trying to do is put some sense into this so we just don't have a proliferation of task forces that don't communicate, do not share intelligence information, do overlap and duplicative work. Are there task forces that are doing a good jobs? Certainly. You know, are there task forces that need to be continued? Probably certainly. Um, some of the funds will come from discretionary money. Some will come from the fact that they'll join with DEA, FBI, uh, state and local funded task forces. And uh, some will pick, be picked up by state and some, I guess, will disappear. Uh, but the, the idea is to get some kind of uh, rational sense into the number of task forces for we have and how they communicate and share information. And so we avoid uh, the problems with the right hand not knowing what the left hand doing and people uh, not sharing intelligence information. We, we are sensitive to the fact that in rural areas, uh, Wyoming and in the rural areas of Michigan, that uh, m many uh, a DA is not always there. And uh, I guess that's a problem that we'll be addressing. The other problem is that I, I guess we look at, if we look at Wyoming and Texas, most of the burnt burn grant program goes for task forces. And so one says, one argues that we'll leave it the uh, local um, option, so to speak. And the question would be, is 90-some uh, percent funding for task forces in Wyoming, Texas, really local option? Is that, is that what the local police departments want? Is that what the local uh, juvenile justice programs want? Is that what the local victims programs want? Is that what the local community people want? We're not so sure that that in the jurisdiction where you have more than 90 percent of your money going for state and local task forces that you're truly reflecting the needs of uh, local government. The Congress, and we're not, the administration is not alone in this. I mean, both the Senate bill and the House bill have targeted money for community policing, uh, boot camps, uh, criminal history records, and things like that uh, with, their, with the, uh, recent, the crime bills in the, in the Senate and in the House. And we think that in a sense, uh, maybe not only the administration, but uh, those people, the congressmen and the senators that propose those bills speak for their constituents as well. I mean, I don't, I don't know if we're getting mixed signals here. Well, no, that's a very clear signal. Once you cut out the, and I'll wrap it up, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your courtesy and time, but, you know, you, you did away with the, underneath this proposal, the discretionary funds that we've used before, the task force funds that we've used before has set off a storm of controversy because those was the task force money we used for undercover drug operations. Every rural area I've been in wants them to continue. Your community policing idea, it's a great idea, but let's face it, you look at population density, you look at the juvenile population, you look at the crime rate. And, and community policing, although it's a great idea, works in urban areas, uh, very limited application, very, very limited application in rural areas. Juvenile crime, because we probably don't have the population density, we, we, we don't qualify there. We in the rural areas, especially northern Michigan, we want these task forces to continue. When you say they're gone, you have set off a storm of controversy. And if you're really listening to the local people, they will probably tell you, those of us who, who are in law enforcement have done it, that these work. They're very good. We want them to continue. Uh, you have a right to shift policy, but don't leave us in the rural areas hanging with nothing. And your DEA task force, we have one in Northern Michigan because the methcathinone problem, consists of one individual. How one individual uh, is going to do this whole task force is beyond me. But it's been the upset teams and the sane teams that we have, which are a drug task force, which have really helped out and made a difference because we do cooperate, we do coordinate, not only on drug ish information, but these multi-jurisdictional multi teams lead to further cooperation and coordination amongst law enforcement. And what I'm telling you is we don't want these things taken away from us. And, and I think we know what works, and uh, we want that part to continue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Stupak. Uh, Mr. Horn? 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me uh, review this from an organizational stand so I can understand it. Uh, Ms. Kennedy Townsend, you are Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Office of Justice Policy Programs. Justice Programs, yeah. Now, you report to whom? Um, I report to Lori Robinson, who's the Acting Assistant Attorney General for the Office of J Justice Programs. And she would report to whom? Uh, the Deputy Attorney General. And then he reports directly to the Attorney General? Yes. Uh, or, or, when she. The, or she. Or uh, she. We hope. <laughs> when, the, uh, when the decision was made, was that recommended from the program people reporting to you that this change be made in the burn program, or was that made by you, the acting assistant attorney general, ahead of you, the deputy attorney general? That's a great question. Um, it was really made by the administration. Um, I think... Uh, You're saying the Office of Management and Budget or the White House? Yes. Well, yes to what, oh, both? I, I think it was made by both looking at, um, we have, a very, as you know, a very tough fiscal right. time, and uh, we uh, want to put, uh, we want to focus our efforts on crime prevention and, and, and punishment. And the question is, where can you go that you can focus your efforts, and where's a, a, a group money that may be better spent? in a different way. Now, was so, that just a broad philosophical question as guidance to the department as to how to look at programs to get the money they needed, or was it specifically said by the Office of Management and Budget, get rid of the burn program, we don't think it works? No, it was never said that we don't think it works. That, that was never, I mean, burn grant, as we all agreed, has done lots of good things, many worthy programs. The question is, as you know, at one point, you have to make uh, judgments as no, to what would be better. I appreciate better. that. I, so I've it was not, it was never a, a knock on the burn grant. Uh, it was a belief that you can s address many of the issues that the burn grant uh, already, d through different ways, through right. the community. You know, you've heard it <laughs> this No, no, this I, I'm just trying to get the trail first yeah. so I understand the it's situation. A, I have great sympathy for people involved in trying to make a lot of things happen with yes. very little resources. I've been an executive most of my life. But let me ask you now, what, what was specifically the guidance? Did it mention specifically the burn program? If you... Yeah, if you're asking whether there was a lot of support for the burn pro program, yes, there was in, in the Department of Justice. Well, no, I'm trying to get it straight as to the guidance from the Office of Management and Budget, part of the Executive Office of the President, and or the White House, who whichever special assistants right. are involved there, or the drug yeah, czar. Yeah. I think the, you know, the Office of Management and Budget uh, decided, looking at lots of programs across the Department of Justice as well as across the whole department, you know, all the federal agencies, thought that this was a program that could be eliminated or cut. Okay. So that was their suggestion. That yes. It did not come within the bowels of the Justice Department. No, it did not. All right. Now, th having said that and knowing where the arrow's coming from, the question then is, uh, how much did the Justice Department want to defend this program at the working level where you do know the and Justice your Department career civil servants know what to do? So you're saying your career servants recommended that this program be defended. They thought it worked. Sure. Okay. It does. I mean, there's no question. It does question. work. There's no question on that. And you recommended that it be defended. Is that correct? Maybe we can put, if, if I may, yes. in a little bit of context. Um, the, the, as you noted, the administration and the department has been faced with some very hard choices. Right, I know um, that. With the, the discretionary spending caps, um, the attorney general was faced with, you know, OMB guidance as to here, you know, these are your discretionary, well, and congressionally mandated um, caps. And when the choices come down that OMB and the Attorney General had to face, there were choices in terms of, of what discretionary spending, the immigration program, prison expansion, other discretion. And, there, and there's, as I think someone alluded to earlier, there is a little bit of a twist here too because the crime control fund um, which the administration supports um, which will 
uh, fund, right? Now, the Senate version includes um, some 22 point something um, billion dollars over five years. Those programs are not um, hit by the discretionary spending cap as hard as some of the existing spending programs. So there, the state and local assistance um, flexibility is greater within the those that can be funded out of the crime control fund. So we really were, there were very hard choices to be made and the choice that the administration made was there were some things within the department's very limited discretionary funding. We did not want to cut FBI agents. We did not want to cut DEA agents. We did not want to ha be unable to activate already constructed prisons. Um, and you have cut immigration agents, however. Am I not correct? Uh, there is also a major immigration initiative um, included within the crime control fund, I believe. I don't know yes. the details. Y of the yes funding. or no? You have. I, I cut. don't. I do you, not know the answer to that. You do not know because we I understand look at it. <laughs> that you have cut those, and yet we've got a crisis on every border and every port. Uh, so we don't understand we're putting, that. There's, there's we're, we're putting putting there's almost million $400 dollars in a proposal million dollars into to increase border yeah. patrol and alien address the alien problems. That's it's in there, but budget. There's a 22 percent okay. increase in the INS budget. I do not know precisely yeah. how that works yeah. out in agent let, manpower. Let me just ask so I get the organizational hierarchy straight. Now, uh, it, it's Ms. Mastali, is it? Mastali. Mastali. Your position is what? I'm also a deputy assistant attorney general in, however, in the office of policy development. Okay. And what role did the policy development office have in making these basic decisions? I don't believe that the decision, the decisions no, were made. No, in recommending, let's let's change that. What role did the policy analysis office have in recommending what be looked at and what be seriously considered for either elimination, revision, uh, consolidation, whatever? We participated in the discussions of what the priorities were and what the constraints were. Um, the office did not make a specific policy recommendation um, regarding this issue. Okay, there's nothing in writing then anywhere that says we recommend you seriously look at this because we just don't think the idea of drug task forces is very good. The administration's policy, and I can appreciate that, says look not only at supply, but look at demand. That's a very reasonable position to take. I don't knock that. But I'm just trying to get the framework of reference in which people function here. So did the office, your office, particularly target the burn program? That's all I want to know. No. Okay. You're saying no. Uh, fine. Then so the, the germination comes from OMB. You've got a serious resource problem. So the heat's on to look at where you can find flexibility for some things you want to do under the law and where you've got to squeeze the money out to do other things that there's great pressure to do. That's a fair Who made the first decision then that really counted? All this is floating around in your various divisions, but it, was it made at the assistant attorney general level or the deputy attorney general level? I could not answer with confidence precisely who made what recommendation. It is, in fact, an ongoing process of exchange in which the Attorney General and the Deputy Attorney General and the Assistant Attorney General for the Justice Management Division work closely with OMB, with the White House policy people, as well as, as many others, um, and the head of each of the components. And it's a process, as, as you are well aware, are of <coughs> guidance and passbacks. On, um, well, presumably, and it rather, I would rather say that that the decision evolved as opposed to having been made at well, any point. Well, it sounds in like time. nobody left any fingerprints either. Uh, it, uh, what I'm curious is, I, I, mean, I understand how these are done. Usually, there's a priority ranking. Somebody at the operating level has to say, what's our first choice to keep, what's our second choice to keep, so on down. And then you fight for it. Or you're supposed to fight for it, the way most bureaucracies work. I mean, is that what happened? A, a bottoms-up operation? Or was this a top-down operation as to what you get rid of? Do you want to say something, Jack? I, I don't know. Um, we give our input. And um, we live with the decisions that are made. I mean, we give, I mean, 
I think we, we gave our best input. And uh, there are other people who have other inputs from a variety of sources. And then we live with the decision that's made, and we, we support it uh, and we'll implement it if the yeah. uh, Congress, in its wisdom, seems to uh, will pass the bill. I mean, the. Yeah. Well, the, uh, I would assume if I were the Assistant Attorney General, I would have made the decision in my division and then taken it up to the deputy, and I've got to compete with your area, the staff area, and other line areas, and so forth. Is that, isn't that how it was made? The assist, acting Assistant Attorney General made the first decision on this? On what? Uh, on the burn program. Either you want to keep it or you don't want to keep it. Well, we, the, the Office of Justice Programs, Bureau of Justice Assistance, made its, made its recommendation to the administration, and then the administration uh, re rejects it in whole or in part, and then we live with it. I don't. You, you mean to say you don't even go to the Attorney General before that, or did you have the Attorney General's decision? I, 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 I think the there's, a, there's a chain of command. Right? Involved right. In this there's a chain of command. We go through the chain of command. In, yeah. in this process, this was not an easy decision. Um, I don't well, think, I think that they're, the, the people that, that are being fingered to a certain extent yeah. here also had to make very hard choices, um, and there are certain administration priorities. Um, there is some, as indicated, there is the Crime Control Fund or many of these other yeah. well, assistance in, programs. Well, in deference to my colleagues, I'm not going to beat this dead horse anymore, but it, what it sounds like to me is what I've seen in every human organization I've ever been involved with, federal, state, and local, is that you've got staff people in the central operation that have too much influence on what line officers ought to be doing in the operating organization and that you're listening to the staff examiners in budget and wherever and they're saying this is what we don't like and we've been around here for 30 years kid so listen to us and uh, you sort of either cave or you don't cave is what the process seems to be to me. I mean, nobody can find fingerprints. We're hard put to say when the deputy AG or assistant AG or AG decided it. And it just seems like it evolved. I mean, you know, like it's in the air somewhere. Well, let me ask you now. You said you're going to need 300 more people to distribute the resources. Now, that's the resources in your office. Well, it's not. It's in the uh, Department of Justice. The Attorney General, under the proposed legislation, the Attorney General has responsibility for administering it and to use what components and mechanisms she sees fit. Well, okay, where are the resources being spread to administer it and this type of state assistance, local assistance program, is that focused in your office primarily? Uh, yeah, oh, it, the, the, um, the Office of Justice Programs is the part of the Justice Department that works with localities and, right. and states and okay. so so is most of the 300 going there and they're mostly going to be reading grant proposals is that it and giving uh, technical assistance okay. as you yeah I understand that. yes what, what the obvious question is yes. isn't there a better way to do this like get back to revenue sharing where the local people can get the money based on a formula and the local people that are on top of the problem can make the decision as to how they best use the money. Well, as you know, that's, that's an issue that is um, b being debated as you, uh, in the crime bill as to how that, um, the, uh, the dollars will be distributed. And there is some, some people who would like to have it all by formula, and in which case uh, I assume that we wouldn't have as many um, new employees. And there are others who think that you should target the money to the areas of greatest need. And I think um, that will be, uh, there are different versions in the House bill, there are different versions of the Senate bill, and that will be worked out. And I think... Well, and I understand that, that good people can disagree on some of that. But uh, I take it you are now operating the community-based policing grants that are coming out, are you, from Justice? That's your division. It, it, we should probably clarify a, yes. a, a little bit. Yes. Um, First, the, the, the final decision on precisely how um, all of the new grants um, will be handled and managed is, has not been made. It is hard to make final decisions absent final legislation. Um, the police hiring supplement, which is the $150 million program that we were discussing, was in fact managed by a task force. It was such a high priority of the Attorney General that she put together and, and very personally um, was involved 
in a task force that was made up by experts from the Bureau of Justice Assistance, from the National uh, Institute of Justice, and other components of the Department of Justice, um, because it was a different program from those which we had previously had experience. While there are community policing grants um, run out of OJP currently, this was different and we're, the Attorney General is committed to using what we have learned over the years with administering programs in OJP, what we learned in administering the police hiring supplement program, and to develop both the most cost-effective and, if you will, user-friendly um, way of assisting states and localities, applying also the, the, the National Performance Review guidance and operating within the context of only having essential to make it work personnel involved. So while the, there, are, there are budget projections on what it might be, and I'll note that those projections are not for permanent personnel, but for the life of the program, the I, final decisions have not been made. Yeah, I, well, I appreciate that because I'm leading to that. Uh, I appreciate the speed with which you operated to get the first round out. I had the pleasure of being with uh, Mayor Reardon uh, since part of the city of Los Angeles is in my congressional district. In fact, one of the more difficult parts. And I was delighted that the city of Los Angeles was recognized in the first go around when we had the conference call with the president. Uh, what concerns me is the second, and we are about to go on the third go around, are we? Third round will be, is expected in yeah. very early spring. Uh, I've got 70% of Long Beach, California, which is the second largest city in L.A. County, 450,000 people. They were not recognized in the first. I could understand it if L.A. was recognized. I could not understand why they weren't recognized in the second. They had more damage, more buildings burned to the ground proportionally than the city of Los Angeles. But since TV is in the city of Los Angeles, the world thinks everything happened in Los Angeles. So uh, I would appreciate it if they take a careful look over there, and that will be my test of the ability of discretionary judgment on grants to the states and cities. Uh, uh, if, if very I, parochial standard, but it will be I, my test. An understandable one. Yeah. If I can make one point, however, yeah. um, in response to that, the, there will be a number of superb applications from very needy jurisdictions that will not be funded under the $150 million police hiring supplement. Um, there were uh, 2,700 20, applications received. Um, there, is, there will be a, a larger dollar amount. The, the first round was a substantial portion. The second round was very small. Um, the third will complete the process. But I think it's indicative of, of the need, the demand for that program. In fact, the President noted it in, in one of his speeches, just demonstrates the need for enactment of the larger program, which will provide very substantial. We're talking about the difference between 2,000 potential officers funded for the police hiring supplement and 100,000 proposed with the larger policing initiative. So I, I would encourage you not to be totally dissatisfied if the, dis, the uh, jurisdictions within your district are not fully funded, but encourage them to apply in the hopefully uh, soon to be implemented larger program. Well, you will probably also have one program you haven't heard about that uh, Mr. Wynn of Maryland and I co-authored is in the Defense Authorization Act. The President sent me the pen with which he signed it, and that is to provide that if you're a member of the services leaving involuntarily because of the downsizing due to the Cold War, roughly a half a million people, all races, ethnicities, and genders, and join a local police department, either municipality or county sheriff, there will be reimbursement up to 25000 the first year, 25000 spread over the next two through five out of the defense budget. Originally, $50 million was in there, but when the Senate said, oh, we can find money everywhere to get the 100000 the House decided, gee, if they've got all that money, we're desperate, uh, so it's $15 million in there with report language that the demonstration project will be in Southern California. I, I hope 
you'll be pleased to know that we have heard about this yeah. and have been having discussions with the Defense Department Good. and are preparing to work with them to work out the best way of implementing that initiative. Right. Good. Well, I'm delighted to hear it. Last point is this. As I look at the figures, there seems to be quite a varying pass-through from the states to the localities. Is there any feeling in the Department of Justice with your experts that have gone over these proposals as to what the variation is due to? You mean under the burn formula grant? Yeah. Jack, maybe. Let's see. Um, the pass through is a statutory requirement, and we use a statistics, I'm um, sorry, excuse me, uh, the data that we collect, which is the re ratio of state expenditures to local expenditures. So the state is required when they get the formula grant program to pass through that same proportion to local jurisdictions, at least, excuse me, at least that proportion to local jurisdictions as is now spent local. So most police departments are local, most uh, corrections facilities are um, state. So if they spend 20 percent for state law enforcement, they can keep 20 percent. 80 percent would be spent at local level for law enforcement at state. They pass through 80 uh, percent. Many states exceed that uh, pass through requirement. So where you have a strong state police operation, you might well have less of a pass-through than right. I'm, I'm looking at That's Virginia correct. with 30 percent right. uh, versus California with 63 percent pass-through. And I was just curious how much discretion it, is in there by the state. It all comes from the figures that we collect uh, based on what's spent at the state level and what's spent at the local level. Okay. Well, thank you. I think I understand the process a little better. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Mr. Horn. Ms. Thurman? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize for coming in late. However, we were over at the uh, old executive building getting our briefing with the Florida representatives from the Attorney General, so Great. we were kind of doing the other side of this, so I apologize. However, though, in, when, in uh, knowing that this hearing was going to come up, so I'll just make this very brief, um, we certainly have heard from our folks at home of their concern of um, this program being disbanded. And I guess probably from the same thing that always happens is that they feel like they have accomplished some things, they've moved forward, you know, they're on the right track, and then all of a sudden, like lots of other things, gosh, you know, this was a great idea in 1986, we just don't think it's going to be a great idea in 1994, and here they are moving along, and, you know, they've done some statewide planning, they've, you know, really put some effort into this, and then all of a sudden they're being told, oh, guess what, it's over. So I, that's kind of the message that I would like you to take back, that I think that when we have programs that work, that we ought to make sure that we, we see these working, and, and and they may not be working from your side of it, but they certainly are working from the sides of our communities and, and how they're implementing. And the only other thing that I would request is I hope that you all are planning to stay for the rest of this hearing because the rest of this hearing is going to actually bring you the real life stories. Those people that have been doing it on the front line, those people that have been working in these programs and not just a paper trail, but just, you know, and you're not just reading about it in the newspaper. These are real stories with real ideas, with real concerns and, and real successes. And I hope that you'll take that time today to listen to, to what they have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and, and if I may, uh, as one who has to plead a sick two-year-old to leave, um, I will assure you that we will request a copy of the full transcript from the committee staff and, in fact, read it and use what we learn from it. I hope so, because, because it really concerns me when we bring people in from the districts and from around this, this country that I, that I find a lot of times that, that the people that need to be listening to the story, we hear it because we're home in our districts so often um, that the people that, that are making some of the decisions don't listen to their stories. I and and also, I think it's different than just reading a... That, um, uh, the acting attorney general, um, Lori Robinson, has made an enormous effort to reach out to people who have uh, benefit or interest in the criminal justice system. We, we've uh, had three focus groups of, of over uh, 60 participants in the last three weeks, and um, we've heard many stories about the, the about the burn grant and about other things that we can do better. So we are really, I mean, under this administration and the NPR, we're really making a serious and, and sustained effort to reach out and listen to people who are affected by what we do and who would like us to do a better job. Ms. Kennedy Townsend, thank you very much. The three of you have done a fine job for us this morning. You've done a great service to the committee, and uh, 
we have uh, additional questions and maybe we could submit those to you and get the response to them. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we'll take panel three, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Pagel, Mr. Wilborn, Mr. Cahill, Mr. Timmons, and Ms. Defoe. And if You're absolutely right. You bet. Would you please uh, stand? I, I'm sorry. I'm going to ask that we swear you in. Wait, one. Raise your right hand. I swear to tell the truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you very much, and I appreciate your patience. I know that's been a a long morning, and uh, we're just delighted that you're here. And uh, is it Mr. Pagel? Yes, I will uh, start with you. Mr. Pagel is the um, um, director of the Division of uh, Criminal Investigation for the state of Wyoming, or is it Michigan? Where are you from? May I? <laughs> Both of them want to claim you, so I. Let me uh, just welcome. Uh Tom Pagel to to the panel. He has uh, is from Wyoming and is head of our DCI there. And uh, there has been a great deal of activity in the in the teams in in Wyoming, and many of the communities have participated. So here's a person who's been on the front line with a peculiar state, a low population state, small towns, small counties. So we're delighted, Tom, that you're here, and thank you for coming. You are from Wyoming. Yes, sir, I am. <laughs> Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I do appreciate the opportunity to address you today, both as the director of the Wyoming Division of Criminal Investigation and as the current president for the National Alliance of State Drug Enforcement Agencies. The BURN program provides states and local governments with the encouragement, with the administrative flexibility, and with the resources to work together to establish and address their criminal justice priorities. And I think that's very important. Consequently, each of these funded programs reflects the criminal justice priority that has been identified and targeted for attention by those states in conjunction with the local officials. I want to specifically address the negative impact that elimination of the burn program would have on the multi-jurisdictional task forces. Make no mistake about the fact that multi-jurisdictional task forces are the most vital element of our drug enforcement efforts. The cooperation, the coordination, the effectiveness of the teams has created a synergistic effect which has led to arrests, convictions, seizures, and forfeitures that we have never before seen. The procedural barriers and jurisdictional boundaries have been bridged, which have historically hindered this sort of, of cooperative law enforcement. The task forces have proven to be adaptable to the changing goals, targets, tactics, capabilities, and compositions that are necessary. Multi-jurisdictional task forces have made a difference in the fight against illegal drugs. It is true, however, that without these fundings, many of the states, such as our own of Wyoming, would not have these task forces. We simply would not have the ability to. Wyoming is a rural state, and sometimes there's a misconception that it's only the metropolitan states that have a drug problem. And let me assure you that that is not the case. Uh, you, you cannot divorce yourself from the problems of the country simply because you're a rural state. The mobility of our criminals today, the interstate system we have, the contacts that are made across the country. And as problems change from area to area, whether it be heroin, whether it be methamphetamine, whether it's PCP, whether it's methacathinone, it, every area has its own specific problems. The, prior to the burn drug grant, Wyoming had as I think most rural states did, a very disjointed effort. The state made attempts. Some of the small rural departments would have one man assigned to drug enforcement, or at least on a part-time basis. It, it was a, a valiant effort, but in most cases not a particularly successful effort. We had limited success, but we did what we could with what we had. With the inception of the burn grant money, Wyoming communities, law enforcement communities, the, the chiefs and sheriffs, and myself, the various state administrators got together, and there was no doubt that, that the drug task forces were the way we wanted to go. We knew we had to combine and cooperate our efforts. The, uh, 
we had some small agencies in the state, and you, and you have to understand that in the state of Wyoming, the majority of our police departments are under 10 people, 10 sworn people. So your limitations are tremendous in what you can do in a drug area. Some of, our, some of our small departments had such a financial problem that they might only be able to contribute $100 to the effort. Others would contribute several thousand. But everybody had a piece of ownership and a pride in ownership in these drug enforcement task forces. One thing that is particularly unique about Wyoming is, is the standardization and cooperative effort. And I, I want to go into just a little more detail on that if I could. An early decision was made to standardize the operations of the six regional drug enforcement teams, and, and that covers our entire state, these six teams. All of the drug enforcement teams operate using the same DCI policy and procedure manuals. All use the same report writing manual and submit their reports to a central repository. All submit criminal intelligence information to this same central repository. All equipment purchases are standardized all the radios, everything is compatible, everything is standardized. And you can, you can imagine the increase in safety and the increase in efficiency by doing this. But we also, and we put this together, we could appreciate the, the importance and the difference of addressing regional needs as necessary. So each of these teams has an advisory board of chiefs and sheriffs who determines what the priorities are for their particular region. Training has also been an important part that is, has brought to Wyoming through this grant. We now have several uh, drug investigation schools, uh, highway interdiction schools, criminal intelligence schools that are funded through, through money from the drug grant. The interdiction along our highways, I-80 being a particular, particularly uh, a highly used interstate for drug transport across the country, we have had tremendous success on highway interdiction efforts not only taking the drugs off the street, but also having the, the luxury, I guess, of being a small state and not being totally inundated by the problem. We have had tremendous success in following these drugs back to their source as well as to their destination, which has led to arrests and seizures in numerous states. The, uh, the trends that we've been able to identify by this centralized system has been a tremendous uh, improvement to uh, increase in our, in our data collection. But something that I don't think I've heard addressed yet today, not to the degree that it should be, is the benefit that the teams have had on, on our impact on other crimes. And you have to realize that in the rural areas, these little specialized teams, you know, this is a crack team, and this is a street team, and this is a conspiracy team, we are generalists. We are not specialists in the rural areas. And that's very important to remember as, as you look at the way this affects other crimes. It is a frequent occurrence for our drug investigations to uncover perpetrators of armed robberies, burglaries, homicides, and other crimes. The weapons that have been taken off the streets from these drug enforcement teams have, uh, have quadrupled since the inception of this. The, uh, you cannot separate drug crimes from violent crimes and other crimes. They, this, is, this is such an integrated problem. You cannot say, I'm going to address this problem, not the other ones. You have to address drugs because everything else is so closely involved. The same is true with the gang activity, that even in the state of Wyoming, we're, Denver is 100 miles from our border. Salt Lake City is 80 miles from our border. And it is very true that as the metropolitan areas put pressure on this gang activity and on drug activity, there is no doubt whatsoever that you see it being pushed to the more rural areas. And we, we have seen that time and time again. I could sit there and quote various statistics to you and, and, and the successes that we've had. But I think probably the one area that I'm most proud of as far as the activities of our team is, is the fact that over 90% of the departments in our state are still involved in drug enforcement task forces. And this is after six years of operation. Now that shows me that something is working there. The turf battles have been put aside. The departments rely upon these teams to provide the drug investigations because coming from small departments like that, you simply cannot do it without this cooperative effort. We are a state with very limited personnel, with limited finances, and with a limited DEA presence, which is only three agents. And again, that's an important point. 
if the federal presence is not going to be there, the grant money is even more important to us. But we are not a state with limited dedication or limited success nor limited cooperation. We have used these funds to build an effective and efficient and probably even an enviable drug task force network. I cannot overemphasize to you how important the Burn Grant Program is not only to Wyoming but to all states. The inherent problems with drug abuse and drug trafficking are too great to ignore. We cannot abandon these efforts and shift all of our attention to new challenges. Efforts and resources to combat violence and gangs should complement drug enforcement efforts, not replace them. I am here today and I am not talking theory with you. I am not talking policy with you. I am talking application. And I am telling you it is absolutely imperative that this burn formula grant be continued. Thank you. Hegel, thank you. Um, Mr. Johnson, um, the Executive Director of Criminal Justice Planning in the State of California, welcome. Thank you very much, Madam <laughs> Chair. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, on behalf of uh, Governor Wilson of California, I'm wearing three hats today. May I at least announce Certainly. all of those hats, uh, representing the National Governors Association and the National uh, Criminal Justice Administrators as well. A and we all concur that uh, this is a, a terrible tragedy, uh, a travesty, uh, if we're going to eliminate uh, the uh, burn fund. As you know, uh, California, and I don't, I don't want to have to speak for Mr. Horn, he knows uh, probably better than I with some of the complaints that, that he, he receives in his office, that California has been known over the last uh, few months as the disaster state. Um, we started off with, with the drought, uh, riots, fires, earthquakes, and uh, not to mention uh, our latest uh, that you might have heard about is the medfly epidemic. And, and now this disaster, which will top them all, I think. If this proposal were to end uh, for California, well, let me tell you, it would have a, a, a devastating uh, impact. We, we fund uh, in California, uh, we received this last year $37,704,000 and a few cents. The prior year, we received uh, $44 million. The year prior to that, $43 million. We're just at the point in California, like many other states, developing what we think now is the ideal uh, sort of uh, program that has had international, not just impact in California. Even though the violent crime rate continued with the use of drugs, uh, we know that we have been successful because had it not been for those monies, I mean, we would, have a, we would really have a horror story to tell. When we talk about a state with everything, we have it, from the good to the bad. From the Oregon border to the Southern California border of Mexico, we now are the transport and transshipment capital for marijuana and heroin in the country. About 70% of that comes through our state. We are now the, our, one of our major cash crops in California, of course, is marijuana. One of the primary sources of LSD is in California, as well as the manufacture of uh, and distribution of meth methamphetamine. Now, that goes again from the southern border to the northern border. When we talk about small states like Arizona and some of the sections of Michigan and Wyoming, we have those same areas in California where we have one or two deputies to patrol 3,000 square miles. Without what we've done in California, we have required a multi-component uh, kind of projects in all of our counties. We fund every county in California with a baseline amount so they can have some impact. What, they, what each county will do with the other money that we provide with them, based upon the crime index, they are required to call a meeting and determine at the local level how that money will be spent in that county. That oversight is given by our office. In addition to that, and I'm making this comment because I'd really like to rebut a statement that was made by the Attorney General. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we, provide, we hold hearings throughout the state, five hearings throughout all regions in California to get input, not only from the law enforcement prosecution, the courts, but also input from the citizens to determine, we let them know, first of all, we give them a history of the program, what we are doing with it, what they would like to see done with it. We explain that there are 21 program areas, the areas that we are currently using, which are 10, and if they would like to see some other uh, areas used, then they are to express that either there or in writing. And we take that in consideration when we submit our, our annual plan. And let me say uh, that, that the, 
the people at the Bureau of Justice Assistance who probably oppose the elimination of the, the fund, I have not been privy to that information, but I would imagine they would agree with, with me on that, have worked very closely with those of us in the states of California and the other states as well. Uh, they know how well it's worked. And I'd like to say they have been very diligent in their duty to, uh, in the oversight of how we spend this money. They make sure that we stay to the task of, of ensuring that the money is spent where there is the greatest need after there's local input. And at my level, I make sure that that is carried out, their wishes are carried out. We've tried to reach every community in some way in California, and I think we have by the process that we have. $37 million is not a lot of money, but it has stretched a long way, and we are now just getting with some consistent type of funding on this fund for the past three years that has enabled has enable us to do a lot of the things that we would like to do. In terms of upgrading technology, we talk about all the task force and most of our projects, we have 39 multidistrital task force in addition to, to the nine other program areas where we have people working in. We've tried to improve the technology by working with, not only within California, but with the southwest border states to uh, use some of this money for a project we call SENS. That's the state integrated narcotic system. The first order, of course, is to make sure that our officers who are working on the streets are protected. We talk about the duplication of effort. We've avoided all of that because we do have a one thing that we have established in California is, is that we've established a collaboration and cooperation really unheard of in California, especially uh, since the Olympics. We had a great collaboration during the 1984 Olympics. We have not seen anything like that until we put all these, this effort that we put forth in this because they recognize if they don't work together that we're not going to be successful. And with all of the effort, with all of the, the, the tons of cocaine and heroin and all of the, the, uh, the money that we've seized in California, we really have only touched the tip of the iceberg. We say now, well, we're in a position to have even more impact. Why take it away? I didn't hear anything earlier today that would convince me that there is something in place that will replace this in a timely fashion that will give us the opportunity in the states like California or in the smaller states to be able to continue this effort to try to do something about the drug and violence that it's creating in all of our states and around this country. We are leading the nation in all of the areas that we talked about. If these funds are taken away, they use the discretionary model, if they use the 100,000 cops on the street, I can tell you it will not have, if any impact at all, will not have very much impact on what we are doing in California. He's explained the task force operation. I don't know that I need to go into that, but I can tell you something. We have excellent cooperation from the federal level. I'll give you one example of how we deal with that with our, in our Emerald Triangle and our Marijuana Suppression Project. We have all of the agencies working together, the federal people, the DEA, and in those where we have government lands, the Bureau of Land Management, Division of Forestry, and all of those monies now are compiled, with, are pooled with, with the money that we receive from uh, the Burn Fund, and we are now working uh, more efficiently and effective with that money. Uh, we make sure that every dollar that's spent in the Emerald Triangle or in any of those other areas now that it's used for the intended purpose, not of just chopping and stacking marijuana, but there are the rest, prosecutions, and certainly uh, seize assets. We've been able to do uh, some great things in addition to bringing on the feds with the money that we have. It has allowed us to expand our marijuana suppression program from seven counties to 14 counties. And we have in California a marijuana problem, indoor, outdoor growth problem in about 43 counties. Uh, so our problem is expanding. It's not decreasing. My recommendation would be to the administration is to expand or increase the amount of money that's going to the, the burn fund, not decrease it, and not, not piddle it away with some of the other programs that I heard earlier today. We are not arbitrary, as the Attorney General say, in how we deal with those monies. We take it very seriously. And yes, we, I agree with her that we should use the money wisely, and we think that we do. Are we perfect? No, we're not. But I would tell you this, we are about as perfect as you can come with the amount of money that we're receiving. And, and we do pass through, by the way, Mr. Horn, for your information, we're up to now 65% pass through to the locals. Uh, we've done that by making some sacrifices in my office to make sure that we get as much money out to the locals and to the state organization that's supporting us in this effort as possible. Uh, that will end my uh, testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jensen. Mr. Wilborn, um, Director of the Texas Narcotics Control Program, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chairman. <coughs> 
members of the committee. Do you have more hats? Ma'am? Do you have any other hats? Uh, <laughs> I've probably got a lot of old hats that I could wear. Uh, we've, got, we've got so much um, that we represent. Uh, but what I've got to tell you is, is that um, these old hats that we've got are kind of perforated. They've been shot at so many times. Uh, uh, Madam Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Jimmy Wilbur, and I'm the director of the Texas Narcotics Con Control Program. We're out of the Criminal Justice Division of Governor Ann Richards' office. Uh, for the record, I would like to submit the testimony of the Honorable Ann W. Richards, the Governor of Texas, a map of the impact areas of the Texas Narcotics Control Program, and written testimony of Mr. Hank Webb, the Texas Representative to Operation Alliance, and and our coordinator for the Texas High Intensity Drug Trafficking Areas. I'm going to deviate from this for just a moment and read something to you that comes from a something that we received in our office the other day. It's a national drug control strategy. It says, reclaiming our communities from drugs and violence. On page 9, it states, uh, with respect to the supply of drugs on the streets, law enforcement agencies, including at the international level, have achieved record seizures of illicit drugs. However, the available drug supply is still sufficient to satisfy the needs of the existing drug-using population. Further reductions in illicit drug availability are essential if demand reduction efforts, particularly against hardcore use, are to prove effective and not be overcome by a cheap and plentiful supply of illicit drugs. Now that, I think, comes from our administration. Um, uh, my name is in there, by the way. It's misspelled, but nevertheless, it's in there. Uh, uh, we, we have tried very hard in Texas to do a job that I believe Congress wanted us to do. Uh, our original task forces were poorly equipped and had limited experience and training. There were few established working relationships with other drug enforcement agencies. Many of our task forces were in rural counties which had little or no narcotics enforcement at the state and local <coughs> level. Uh, many times in our counties, we're doing good to have a 24-hour officer in, in many of the counties. Texas is a big place. We've got 254 counties and most of them are rural. Uh, we've got three of the largest uh, cities in, in, the, in the country, in the top ten, in, in Houston, in Dallas, and in San Antonio. However, it, uh, that's, that's just small portions. You're talking about a lot of rural Texas. And whenever we have put the squeeze on the drug dealers, they've moved out to the countryside, and we've got lots of countryside with without people for a long, long way. And these people were able to, to cook their methamphetamine and, and do a lot of other uh, damage and prepare themselves and, and house these drugs and transship them uh, with a lot of ease because we did not have uh, the, the people that were out there that knew anything about narcotics. We have that with the drug task forces. We cover 220 of the counties with our drug task forces now. We've worked diligently to train and obtain modern equipment for our officers while building working partnerships with all other law enforcement agencies. We've had some tremendous seizures of drugs. As a matter of fact, just the other day, I think we got 8,000 pounds of marijuana. And if, if California is, is doing greater than that, uh, they've got a problem that's worse than ours. One of the things that I think is extremely important that you need to be aware of is that we have 1,248 miles of the Mexican border, of the United States border with Mexico, is Texas. And it is extremely difficult for us to man that entire area. On top of this, we've got 660 miles of coastline. And what we do with our multi-jurisdictional task forces is put our finest police officers in them for this war on drugs. These drugs are des destined for shipment to Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, Nebraska, and a lot of other states. Uh, all these are seized in Texas. They weren't meant for Texas, but they're seized there, and they're never allowed to arrive and, and poison the young people of America. Consistent with our multi-agency and multi-jurisdictional task forces, we have enhanced prosecution teams. We've created 
drug impact courts. We've improved our criminal just justice information systems. We've implemented drug prevention programs through our task forces. Uh, I wanted to tell you just a moment about El Paso, Texas. Uh, they are going to start using their schools as community centers to be open at till 10 o'clock at night so that we can have something for our kids to do, libraries that are open, uh, gymnasiums that are going to be open. And we've got some of this is, is, has been able to uh, be accomplished by our drug task forces. It's because of them that we've moved in this direction. Uh, sheriff Leo Samaniego is the sheriff in El Paso County, and he has, he has been a real force in, in trying to get this done in that area. Uh, each of our task forces is controlled by a local board of directors composed of sheriffs, chiefs of police, and other agency heads. These boards represent uh, the different communities that are involved in this. They determine the priorities and focus on enforcement issues which have the greatest impact on that community. Community policing is not new to us. We hear it so much today that it is almost nauseating. But community policing is something that we have done for many, many years. It isn't something that is new to us. Our officers have performed admirably, many times making the supreme sacrifice in an effort to seize these large quantities of drugs. We lost a young officer in the Houston area in December. Uh, he had a vest on. Uh, today, we uh, have one in Dallas who is paralyzed from uh, his chest down for the rest of his life. He was wearing a vest also, making an entry. These people have given you everything that they have got. And I say given you, they've given their communities everything that they have in order to stop these individuals who have become rich through trafficking and narcotics at the expense of all Americans. If we abandon the Edward Byrne Memorial Block Grant most of our task forces will be eliminated in Texas. I can guarantee you that. Probably 95% of them. And we're talking about some people not doing a good job, people doing a great job. Coupled with the reduction of the federal initiatives and the reduction of the federal officers, our ability to stem the flow of illegal drugs will cease. We will return to the isolated agency drug enforcement that we had before and our rural areas will no longer have any protection. I heard something earlier that was mentioned that said that our task forces didn't work with uh, and share information with federal agencies. That's not true. Three of my drug task forces are headed up by drug enforcement agency agents. We have, uh, we have people all over the state we work together with the U.S. Customs Service, with the FBI. We've got, we've got people from the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, we've got them from every possible a federal agency working within our task forces to do the job that I think Congress wanted us to do. Uh, as far as overlap and overtime and money that is being wasted, it, it's not true. It just doesn't happen with our task force. And earlier a question was asked, uh, about if our task forces would be able to qualify for this money. I already called, and I was told no. Uh, we need your help. We need it badly. I think the people of this country are depending on what our people do in our task forces. And <coughs> God, we're depending upon your help in order for us to be able to continue. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cahill um, is the chairman of the National Legislative Committee for the Fraternal Order of Police, the Grand Lodge. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chairman, uh, members of the uh, committee. My pleasure to uh, appear before you today on this very important law enforcement issue. My name is Donald uh, Cahill. I'm testifying today on behalf of approximately 250,000 members of the uh, Fraternal Order of Police which is the largest uh, organization of uh, professional rank-and-file law enforcement uh, personnel in the country. I'm appearing here at the request of our national president, Dewey Stokes, who is unfortunately uh, unable to be with you. In addition to serving as chairman of the uh, FOP's legislative committee, I'm also an active duty police officer serving with the County Police Department of Virginia. I am 
currently and for the past three years been assigned to a federal, state, local drug task force here in the Washington metropolitan area. And I've been a police officer for over 22 years in this uh, particular area. I am here today to voice opposition to the elimination of this Edward Byrne Memorial State and Local Law Enforcement Assistance Grant Program funding in the fiscal year 95 uh, budget request of the Department of Justice. The Fraternal Order of Police is strongly against any reduction in funding for the state formula grant uh, component of the DOJ program. And while it's true that the department would increase the burn discretionary grant appropriation from 50 million to 100 million, this simply will not make up for the loss of the state formula grant component. While the department's budget proposed to provide $172.2 million for juvenile justice and delinquency pro, uh, prevention programs, of which $10.5 million would be allotted to a formula grant program in addition to the $100 million, critical areas of need are still left out. One particular need that is funded through the Byrne Grant uh, formula grants uh, are the federal, state, and uh, also the state and local task forces. These task forces are not only effective in arresting many drug dealers, but were also successful in seizing the assets of the traffickers, which were then put to work on the federal, state, and local level, funding other important programs for crime reduction. I noted uh, in a recent article in the Legal Times, uh, Justice Department thinking on this issue is characterized as being that of the reason uh, the Attorney General Reno is so willing to dispose of the uh, program is because the department has so little control over it. The article implies that the thinking of justice is that this money has been doled out in an ad hoc manner without the benefit of a national strategy. Well, the FOP believes that this kind of thinking from Washington is one of the problems we in a state and local government are constantly faced with. Crime is now and always will be a state and local problem. Each state and each region have problems that are peculiar to them and only them. The problems of Los Angeles are not like the problems of Cheyenne, but the problems of Los Angeles may be like the problems of Riverside and Bakersfield, and the problems of Cheyenne may be like the problems of Casper. And for that reason, it's important for the overall state strategy to play a major role in allocation decisions. Another area that the FOP is concerned about is the adverse impact that the elimination of these formula grants will have on smaller jurisdictions, particularly those in rural communities. The national strategy pays particular attention to the large urban problems where the governments in charge have let crime get out of control over the years and where gang members sometimes outnumber law enforcement officers. With the elimination of these grants, the multi-jurisdictional uh, drug task force will be forced to either go out of operation or be severely curtailed. What is likely to happen then is that crime will move out of these urban areas and into the rural communities, communities in northern Virginia, southern and western Maryland, and parts of West Virginia have already experienced this phenomenon. Now, it comes at no surprise that some within the Department of Justice want to eliminate these funds in favor of retaining other discretionary accounts. In fact, such a move would probably be met with favor by many big city mayors. Their ability to translate political clout into direct funding for their pet initiatives would be greatly enhanced by a switch to direct funding. If you take a look at the Department's proposed 95 budget, uh, you will see many programs funded that will help law enforcement agencies fight crime. But how many of these programs will be there for everyone, especially the rural departments? How many will be there to assist your constituents? Go back to the police departments in your respective district and ask them one question. Would your department and its various anti-crime initiatives be better off not receiving assistance through the formula grant program but relying instead on the discretionary funding? Two very important programs funded through the Department of Justice which merit mentioning today are the formula grants and the regional information sharing system. Both of these problem, uh, programs are extremely helpful to local police agencies and both were apparently not funded in the latest budget. This sort of prioritizing is puzzling to many of us in law enforcement. In fact, I do not know of any law enforcement agency or organization that was afforded the opportunity to have input into the decision making behind some of the department's funding allocations. The FOP has been around Washington long enough to have had the opportunity to see administrations come and go. And it seems that for two months each year, the decision makers at the various departments and agencies 
those who have a handle on what programs within their jurisdiction are working and why are placed in a vacuum while the numbers crunchers at the Office of Management and Budget juggle programs to make the overall numbers add up correctly according to their agenda. While the Department may be left to defend the actions of OMB, there can be no doubt that the budget would have looked somewhat different had DOJ prevailed over uh, OMB. The Fraternal Order Police, while concerned about the retention of the Byrne Grant uh, block funding, does not believe that either the Department or this administration are insincere about their support for law enforcement in battling crime. Despite our agreement on the uh, larger issues and uh, as representatives of those on the front lines of the war against violent crime, we would be negligent not to dispute these funding allocation decisions. There is no disputing the fact that the Department's proposed budget contains, contains funding for many important anti-crime initiatives. At the same time, however, we must remember that the programs that have a proven track record uh, of accomplishment, this did just not happen in the latest round of uh, budget negotiations. Yesterday, the administration announced a comprehensive and in integrated effort to combat violent crime in America based upon a partnership among all levels of the law enforcement community, federal, state, and local. If we are truly to work in partnership in pursuit of this noble objective, those of us who do this for a living must be consulted in the allocation of scarce resources. No longer can we take, make these decisions based on anything but the facts. Mr. Chairman, the FOP appreciates the opportunity to appear before your subcommittee this morning. Uh, might I also ask uh, that I be excused? I have a, a, uh, another commitment that with this weather is going to run very close. We clearly understand that, and you may be excused, and we appreciate your testimony. Uh, we may have some questions, specific questions for you that we'd like to maybe uh, send to you in writing and have you respond. Be, uh, more than uh, more than happy. Thank to you sir. for your patience. Thank you. thank you for being here, sir. Uh, I would also like to thank Ms. Thurman for filling in for me. I uh, had to step out. I had other commitments as well, and I appreciate that very much. Mr. Timmons. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the subcommittee. I appear before you this morning in a threefold capacity. First, as executive director of the Alabama Sheriff's Association, representing all 67 sheriffs in the state of Alabama. I've been in my 20th year in that capacity. Second, as a member of the Governor's Drug Advisory Board, which oversees the administrative and awarding of the Brian, of the Byrne Formula Grant Program money for Alabama. And third, as a subgrantee and recipient of these funds. Needless to say, I was shocked and dismayed to read where the President had eliminated the Edward Byrne for Memorial Program for the states in his budget proposal to Congress. If this is allowed to happen, it will turn back the clock in our fight against crime and violent crime and drugs in Alabama. We have made tremendous strides in our efforts to combat crime and violence in Alabama by using these federal funds coming to our state. But before I get into an analysis of our efforts in this area, I want to acquaint you with the impact our state would have in the loss of jobs and services our state would suffer if this program is allowed to be eliminated. In terms of economic development in our state, we will lose 487 jobs if these funds are provided to our local communities. These employees employed at the local level pay, pay taxes, buy goods and services, and provide a service to the community. These funds remain in the local communities, which in turn are good for the economic growth of our state and nation. Therefore, when you consider the budget, please don't just look at what we are doing to the criminals, but what this program means to our economic economy as well. The impact will be devastating in the rural states and this, these funds are eliminated. In 1993, our allocation was $6,884,000. In 1994, our allocation is $5,244,300. These funds are passed through to the local units of governments at the ratio of 92 percent. The remaining funds are provided to state agencies that work for the betterment of our local units. These funds are provided programs that let our local units address their crime problems. These pro programs are local, multiple unit task force made up of all segments of law enforcement, prosecution, courts, and integrate with federal agencies as well. While we spend approximately 62 percent of our total funds on task force, we provide services outside the realm of a strictly related task force. We provide planning that allows the community the chance to plan and attack their crime problem instead of someone telling them what their problem is. 
The recent removal of $150 million from the burn program by Congress to fund the police hiring supplement at a cop reduced the state's allocation by 16 percent in FY94. Alabama has received three awards from, the supplement of, from this supplement and has hired a total of four officers. By implementing these police hiring programs, we gave up $1,057,000 in the burn program and received $155,904 in police hiring funds. The four officers were hired at extremely rural areas with populations of less than 1,500 each. These areas have already been covered by a task force that was supplying better service and coverage than these small rural towns can provide. Most of our small rural towns have no tax base in which to support the continuation of these officers when the grant expires. On top of this, there is no training or equipment funds for these towns to train and equip these officers, thereby placing an even greater burden on the towns to come up with revenue to support this type of program. The burn program allows the state to plan and implement their strategy and to how to combat violent crimes and to care for their war on drugs. We have 30 multiple agency task forces, 13 DARE programs located throughout the state who last year taught over 9,000 school children, drug treatment programs at the local and state level, and various other outstanding programs that won't survive if the burn program is eliminated by the President and Congress. To change the direction of the burn program from a tremendous partnership with the Bureau of Justice to a dictating federal program in the form of a discretionary grant direct from Washington further erode the state's ability to plan and to address their own crime problems without federal intervention will be devastating to the states. We can see this in the supplemental hiring program. The rural states get very little from these types of programs. The economic impact will be detrimental to our state as we lose the 487 people now employed who earn salaries, pay taxes, and purchase goods and supplies in our state. We need to continue our partnership. We have developed with the federal government and expanded it to the point that we are getting more and more assistance at all levels for the amount of funds we receive. I am including our past year's accomplishments as part of our written testimony showing our success with these funds and programs. I would like to elaborate on one of our successful programs that have been made possible by the Burn program, which would not be possible under the new proposal before Congress. The Alabama Jail Assistance Project began operation in March of 1992. Funding is provided by the Burn program grant at 75 percent, and the sheriffs of Alabama put up 25 percent. The Jail Assistance Project serves all 67 Alabama County jails and 585 Alabama municipal jails. All services have been provided at no cost to the jail and its funds, government entity, and the services would not have been available except through the Burn Formula Grant Program. The Jail Assistant Project has participated in the correctional training of 351 Alabama jail officers, 78 Alabama law enforcement officers, 35 Mississippi sheriffs. Present plans call for the training of an additional 150 Alabama jail officers during the remainder of 1994. Training focuses on various administrative programming and security issues with a strong emphasis on federal court decisions and constitutional rights of inmates. The Jail Assistant Project has completed the guidelines for the development of policy procedure directives for Alabama jails. As a direct result of resources provided by the Burn Formula Grant Program, this manual has been distributed without cost to 67 Alabama sheriffs, 20 Alabama chiefs of police, two California sheriffs, one Ohio sheriff, three Louisiana sheriffs, nine Mississippi sheriffs, one Texas sheriff, and the U.S. Department of Justice, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, the Alabama League of Municipalities, the Louisiana Sheriff's Association, the Mississippi Sheriff's Association, the American Jail Association, and various other government entities. The manual has been used for as a prototype for the development of policy procedures, directives, in various jails throughout Alabama and the United States. Paul Myron, Chief of Custody of the Los Angeles County Officer Sheriffs, commented on the policy and procedure manual in March of 1993. In his letter, I, I quote, I am quite impressed with the expanse of the policy and procedure director's manual. The manual addresses many issues that are important for effective jail operations. The manual's guidelines and reference provide a fundamentality, sound basis from which a jail administrator could effectively manage his or her and responsible directives. 
Chief Marion went on to say it is apparent that this manual will benefit jail administration in the state of Alabama in many years to come. Dr. Ron Holt, Director of Law Enforcement Academy at the University of Alabama, commented on the policy and procedure directives for manual. He quoted, your office has produced a manual that will be useful to every sheriff, administrator, and employee of every sheriff's office in the state of Alabama. The United States Magistrate Judge John Carroll of the Middle District of Alabama commented in a recent letter, I really appreciate the time you took to come to my office to discuss your project. I am tremendously impressed with what you're trying to do. I will discuss the jail service project with my colleagues and offer them my view that I think you could be a valuable resource to, to mediate jail cases. Let me quote on that part. That's where most of my 1983 lawsuits begin. That's where I end up facing that judge at times by many, many criterions that I don't have answers for. So this, this new jail administrative policy procedure manual has been very, very helpful. As a result of the initial meeting with Magistrate Judge Carroll, the Alabama Jail System Project is mediating a series of four lawsuits against an Alabama jail. The Jail System Project will undertake the revision of the Alabama jail standards during the 1994-95 funding period. Originally developed by the Alabama Sheriff's Association in 1981, the Alabama County Jail Standards will be updated to reflect new requirements, blood-borne pathogens, airborne pathogens, Americans with Disability Act, et cetera, and trends for the operation of a constitutional jail facility and to comply with federal court mandates and national standards. The Jail Assistant Project serves as an advocate for the local jail to interview proposed architect designs for new jails to help make certain that new designs reflect contemporary jail design and will result in the construction of a functional and staff efficient facility that will meet the correctional needs of the local jurisdiction as well as to meet federal court mandates and national and state standards. The Jail Assistant Project provides a vast array of technical assistance to local jails without cost, precluding the need to divert meager financial resources for the employment of other <coughs> consultants. The the Alabama Jail Assistant Project has been honored by the American Jail Association in two distinct ways. The March-April issue of American Jails magazine featured the Jail Assistant Project as a workable model. And in May of 94, the Jail Assistant Project will be presented at a program featured in the National Conference of the American Jail Association in Indianapolis. The Alabama Jail Assistant Project will continue to exist and exist and to assist Alabama jails in their effort to upgrade the constitutional minimum efforts insofar as the Burn Formula Grant Program remains intact. The elimination of the Burn Formula Grant Program will have a devastating negative effect on numerous jails that are striving to upgrade all aspects of their operation. Meager resources, especially in rural areas, will preclude the continuation of the Jail Assistant Project without the continued assistance provided by the Burn Formula Grant Program. This is an essential program which must be allowed to continue, not only as a valuable resource for Alabama jails, but also as a national model. This is an example of how only one of our 54, 51 programs that we currently have in Alabama that would not be possible without the Burn Formula. I would like to comment on the pro problem that we, would, that we would have if all of the funds were shifted to the community policing program. While we are in favor of community policing, it is not the answer to our crime problems. Our state is rural. We have two cities that exceed 150,000 in population. Community policing does not work at the rural area. Our sheriff's department covers vast rural areas where community policing is not a valuable solution. Our rural departments cannot walk a beat. However, they can join forces with a strike or a task force and handle the crime problem at that level as we are now doing. We are in favor of community policing as it now stands as one of the authorized 23 purposes allowed by Congress. To remove the other purposes allowed by the act and reduce it to one purpose destroys our efforts to effectively address our crime problem. We implore Congress not to do this. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, I would simply like to say that I deeply appreciate the opportunity to appear before this subcommittee to express our views on the elimination of the burn program we have made too much progress in the criminal justice system to go backward. We have implemented legislation that, walks, that allows the states to plan and address their crime problem. We need to keep this intact and expand on it if we are to ever reach our goal of reducing violent crime and drugs in our state. 
Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Timmons. Uh, for the next witness, I would like to uh, yield to Mr. Stupak to make the introduction. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Ardith Defoe. Uh, we go back some time when she was a police officer with uh, Lansing City Police Department. At the same time, I was stationed in Lansing with the Michigan State Police. Uh, we both went on to law school, uh, went to Cooley Law School in Lansing, night school, as we were both police officers at the time. She's currently director of the Drug Law Enforcement Division of the Michigan Office of Drug Control Policy. Uh, Michigan has unique uh, drug task force teams that uh, Ardith has head up for 87, since 87, 88, since 88. And uh, it combines uh, Michigan State police officers with uh, county, local, and uh, township officials to put up a drug task force. And I look forward to hearing from her. And Ardith, welcome to Washington. And I see you left the cold of winter to come to our snow and slush. But thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Representative Stupak. And yes, uh, <clears throat> I truly expected to come to Washington and find sunshine and uh, something quite different than what we find in Michigan. And uh, in fact, this is the first time I've ever been in Washington when you've had snow on the ground. Uh, and I like to leave that behind when I leave Michigan. <laughs> It's a pleasure to be here this morning, uh, and I want to thank you for the opportunity uh, to discuss the proposal to eliminate the burn fund. News of this proposed loss has been met with great disbelief and dismay by the state and local law enforcement officials. Uh, in fact, they're uh, shocked and, and appalled that they have to plead for restoration of these funds when what they're already what they're getting now is not really effective uh, and not uh, sufficient for what their needs are. And I have been told by law enforcement that elimination of these funds will have the most drastic impact on drug law enforcement that has ever occurred. We began uh, funding a strong uh, supply reduction programs with a multi-jurisdictional effort uh, when the funding began and cooperative state and local regional drug teams with prosecutorial assistance uh, were implemented across Michigan. And we have a map of Michigan showing the various drug teams uh, that we have. Uh, we have some unusual names, as you can see, uh, for these drug teams. Uh, and they're all acronyms for the specific geographical area. You heard Representative uh, Stupak talk about uh, UPSET, which is in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and SANE, which is part of Upper Peninsula and then part of the uh, Lower Peninsula. We, before the drug funds became available, uh, the area, the northern part of Michigan and the Lower Peninsula and the Upper Peninsula were served by five state troopers. That was all that we had available for 40 counties representing that area. With the drug funds, we established seven drug teams uh, in that area, and the arrests have gone up 400%. Uh, and that is very definitely uh, a rural area. I think when people think of Michigan, you often think of Detroit. Uh, which is uh, certainly a part of our problem in Michigan, uh, but we have vast areas of uh, rural lands as well. And I know one of the uh, law enforcement officers said that um, he thought the administration's proposal to eliminate the burn memorial funds, which would eliminate the drug teams in these rural areas, really made the day for the drug dealers because it is in those cornfields uh, in that rural area of Michigan, as well as Texas and Wyoming and California and in all of the other states. It is in those areas that the drug dealers come in and smuggle their drugs in and out. Uh, they can put airstrips in those cornfields. Uh, they can grow marijuana uh, in those cornfields. And if there are not drug uh, teams to do their investigations, uh, those drug dealers um, have just an open market there. And community policing will not address that concern. We could put a community policing officer in Traverse City, as you can see, and maybe one in Marquette in uh, the Upper Peninsula, and one or two in other cities, uh, but they're not going to address those kinds of concerns that we have. With our um, burn memorial funds, we expanded 12 drug teams that were already existing to include uh, the more medium-sized cities and the rural areas. 
We're currently funding 123 police officers in these multi-jurisdictional drug teams with the burn <coughs> funds. Uh, those are 82 local and 41 state police, and we also fund 29 prosecutors. And funding would not be available for those officers with the elimination of the burn funds. Those drug teams work with the federal agencies. I think you heard some testimony earlier today, and uh, one of my other colleagues here spoke to the issue that um, there was a report that the drug teams are not coordinating with the federal agencies. That is simply not so. In Michigan, they work very closely with the FBI, with DEA, uh, with ATF, with Customs. Uh, in fact, if there's a concern in Michigan, is that we need more DEA agents. Uh, as Representative Stupak spoke earlier about the methcathinone problem we have in the UP, uh, we only have one DEA agent. Um, and a concern that I hear frequently is that we would like more DEA agents. They are working with all of those federal agencies, uh, and they do so very cooperatively. Our drug teams also work with education and treatment officials to discuss trends. They work with uh, community leaders uh, to discuss how best they can serve the areas that they represent. And by pooling these resources uh, from a number of counties into one coordinated cooperative effort, the medium-sized and rural areas are able to receive the type of specialized narcotics enforcement that they need. One other uh, concern that was mentioned this morning uh, was in the area of forfeitures and that the drug teams seize the assets of the drug dealers, uh, the assets that they gain through their illicit trafficking. If we begin to eliminate these drug teams, which we'll need to do if the funds are not available, they will also not be available to get the forfeitures from the drug teams or from the drug dealers. And in Michigan, as I think in, in most of the other states, uh, the drug teams use those forfeiture funds to make their match. In Michigan, our drug teams are now providing a 50% match to the burn memorial funds. And they're able to do that because of the forfeitures that they get from the drug dealers. But if we have to cut back, which we will have to, or eliminate, which we will have to, those funds are not going to be available either. I also uh, want to uh, speak to the prosecutorial assistance to the drug teams, and those prosecutors will be lost also. Uh, these drug dealers are very sophisticated. They can afford uh, defense counsel that um, uh, will represent them in the manner that they wish to be uh, represented, fight tooth and nail the drug charges against them. Um, and we need to have well-trained, experienced prosecutors uh, working with these drug teams, and we do have this uh, in Michigan. They're on 24-hour call. They're available to the drug teams and then to prosecute uh, the drug dealers. The national strategy aimed at placing officers in selected urban neighborhoods and emphasizing treatment programs essentially will eliminate this major tool for, drug, for state and local law enforcement, and that has been spoken to. And that is true. There are not other funds. Uh, I'd like to answer your question, uh, Representative Stupak, that you had the, asked the administration when they sat here. And, and you asked if the police hiring grants, for instance, the police hiring funds that are coming through will replace the drug team uh, personnel that's there. Uh, and that is not so. For instance, in Flint, Flint got 14 officers. We fund two into the drug team thing in Flint, and we fund 10 for community policing. We're already funding community policing in our urban areas in Michigan. So they're getting 14 solely for a community policing effort. Those, those officers will not be a part of a multi-jurisdictional effort. But we're already funding Flint for 12 officers uh, through the Burn Memorial Fund. So it's really just a shift in what's going on. And that's true. There were three other cities that got funded as well in Michigan. And uh, the net increase in what is occurring is very, very minimal because if these funds are eliminated, uh, and they will not be replacing uh, officers in a multi-jurisdictional drug team effort. And this brings up another point also. If federal funds for end for drug enforcement and for the drug prosecutions and for the drug courts 
Uh, many treatment centers will lose their primary source of climate, clients, which is the criminal justice system. And uh, treatment, of course, is very important uh, in working with the entire drug problem. But the chronic hardcore drug addict needs the coercive power of the criminal justice system to get into treatment, otherwise they're not going to get there. And in many public treatment centers, over 60% of the clients are there only because of the criminal justice pressure. And ironically, as the pressure in the client base will be reduced if this funding is eliminated, the treatment program funding is increasing. Michigan's current strategy and use of the burn formula funds are providing significant results. The multi-jurisdictional drug teams last year increased their arrest by 31 percent and there was an 85 percent increase in the major drug dealers, the major drug kingpins. In Michigan, we're having multi-county grand juries that the, our drug teams and prosecutors are working on together. We have a statute which provides for that. And it's really allowing us to get to those major drug dealers. Uh, and there was also a 29% increase in drug seizures. I also wanted to mention uh, our prosecutors that are very dedicated, just as uh, the best officers are put into the multi-jurisdictional drug teams, the best prosecutors work with those drug teams. And 97% of the drug offenders convicted were convicted of the most serious charge against them last year, and three-fourths were convicted of all of the charges. One of the most significant aspects of the Burn Memorial Formula Grant uh, funds is that each state can decide how best to use those funds based upon where the dollars for law enforcement are needed most. Michigan holds several hearings each year to determine how the grant fund should be spent. Uh, and notice goes out to over 2,200 governmental officials who are invited to provide testimony at those hearings. And then based on that testimony and community input, a statewide comprehensive drug enforcement strategy is enacted which reflects the needs of communities over the entire state. And one of the great needs that we have had in Michigan is the new uh, and very dangerous drug which has uh, uh, been seized there is meth methcathinone, or we call it CAT. And it's because of the funding uh, of a drug team, OPSET, uh, which was f uh, funded under the Byrne Memorial <coughs> Grant Funds. Uh, in their investigation, uh, they uh, seized the drug. They were able to detect what was there. It's a very dangerous drug. Uh, it's highly addictive. It produces a significant high. The uh, materials and chemicals uh, to produce CAT are very easy to obtain. And uh, in addition to the upset team, which was working there, we also funded a special CAT team. And because of this, we've been able to keep it somewhat under control. Uh, because it is so easy to manufacture, uh, it spreads very quickly. Uh, and it is spreading to some other states, uh, into Wisconsin. And it has appeared in uh, uh, a number of other states, um, and it is a concern. And without that federal funding, uh, we would not have those teams available there to have uh, been able to detect CAT when they did. The Upper Peninsula is a very remote uh, area, very rural America. It only has 3% of our state's population and it would seem the least likely place for such a drug to be introduced. And uh, we did have the drug team there which could respond. Without this drug, it's po without the drug team there, it's possible that CAT could have spread to every other state in the nation. And if the funds are eliminated, the drug teams will not be there and it will seriously jeopardize the ability uh, our ability to hold the line uh, to keep this drug from spreading. And community policing funds will probably not reach the Upper Peninsula. And even so, community policing kind of enforcement kind of activity uh, would not have kept this drug from spreading. Governor John Engler has developed a very comprehensive balanced plan for Michigan's grant funds, which channels more money to the local level. The proportion of Michigan's federal funds directed to local prosecution, to street level enforcement, uh, cops on the beat increased by 31 percent. 
75 officers are funded for street level and neighborhood initiatives along with the 22 pro or 29 prosecutors that we have. And with those 79 officers that we fund uh, for the street level and community efforts, along with our officers in the multi-jurisdictional drug teams, we're funding nearly 200 officers. That uh, funding would be lost uh, with the elimination of these funds. Most states pass about two-thirds of their funds to local governments. Uh, I know that this was a question that was asked earlier. Michigan exceeds their required pass-through by about $3 million, and we pass through nearly 70% uh, of our funds. During 1993, Michigan received from the federal government $47 million for treatment programs, $17 million for drug education, and $14 million for drug enforcement. State and local drug enforcement dollars are already the least of these three approaches to combating the drug problem. To completely eliminate financial support for comprehensive enforcement activities would be a serious blow to law enforcement and to all the communities in Michigan. We need a balanced approach to drugs and crime that is dr tough and smart. Arresting drug offenders alone will not solve the problem. More cops walking a beat in urban cities will not alone solve the problem. We need both, prob both programs as well as prosecutors, drug courts, treatment, and education. Drug enforcement initiatives must have financial stability. Effective narcotic efforts are hindered due to the uncertainty of continued funding. The real drug war and the brunt of its destructiveness are at the state and local level. That's where the dealers are, the users, the crime and violence are. It's at the state and local level. We must not only keep, but should seriously consider an increase in the level of state and local law enforcement assistance. Funding for the Burn Formula Grant Program at its best was at $473 million. Funding for LAAA, which was 20 years ago, at its best was $732 million. And that translates to about $2.5 billion today. 20 years ago, there was not a significant drug problem. Today, drugs and violent crime are the top problems facing America. We ask that the proposal to eliminate the funds be reassessed. To do otherwise would put at great risk the gains that have been made in this nation with the Burn Memorial Grant Funds. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate your testimony. Um, I, I kind of want to follow up on um, Mr. Bowe's um, close there. Um, um, this committee and myself uh, obviously are very supportive of what you do. We, we think you do a great job. Uh, I only, and you all say that your programs have been successful as it relates to drug programs, but we read uh, almost daily about increased use of drugs by high school students and by young people throughout this country, and we read daily about more drugs being smuggled into this country. And uh, if your programs are so successful, which uh, I'm not questioning, I just want you to give me a candid response of what's the problem. I if we're f our programs are good, uh, why is the use of drugs going up? Why is there more drugs smuggled into this country? What, I mean, as experts in this area, do you have an opinion? Do you have specific something that you could say? And, and, and I'm asking you not to hold back if, if you know what the solution to the problem is, please share it with us. Destruction of home life, the split families, and the, and the enrollment of the drug traffic flow now where the kids are selling it, kids are merchandising it, and the families are tolerating it. Where you have these busted families and all, it's a revenue source for them, and a kid can make $400 an hour standing on the corner selling dope, where you'd have to make $4 and a half an hour back working in a car wash or something. And it's just... It's an encroachment there. Is there any solution to that, Mr. Timmons? I, well, I think we're going to have to go. I don't think we can do it at Congress level or at our state legislature. And I served in the legislature, and I was a street policeman in Birmingham. But I think we're going to have to go back to home life. I think we're going to have to go back to the churches. And there's going to have to be something done at home. I think that's where it's going to have to start at before we can get back into it on our end. Anyone else, Mr. Defoe? Yes, I think, first of all, the problem is so immense. And uh, drug enforcement is doing a good job. Uh, they need more dollars and to be able to really be as effective as they could be. 
Going back to the children who are using, and the studies do show that children are beginning to use drugs again and doing so at an earlier age. Um, certainly education is extremely important. And uh, I know there's the, the discussion about when should drug education begin in the schools and that it should begin at a very early age. Uh, that if drug education comes, for instance, at middle school age, that that's too late, that it needs to come uh, very early on. And that it's, it's the three components working together, education, treatment, and law enforcement. They're all very important. And they all need to be funded adequately to do their jobs. Uh, and I think law enforcement sees their role as continually holding that line, holding that line, uh, and in trying to keep the supply levels uh, at least from increasing in, and to decrease, which in there are uh, indications that it is, some of it is decreasing. Uh, but to do that while education and treatment uh, are doing their jobs uh, to assist with this problem. Anyone down here? Mr. Johnson? Yeah, I would just like to add uh, a little bit to what Mr. Timmons indicated earlier and take it a little bit farther than that. I think we spend an awful lot of time trying to, to educate our kids and turn them around when, in fact, they have to go back into the same environment. Well, we've made a terrible mistake, and we put a lot of money into DARE programs, SANE programs, and other programs that are replicated, but we don't deal with the, the, the core issue, and that's the parents. And I think we need to do some parent education uh, to make sure that they understand really what, what, we are, what we're talking about and change the values. We have a societal problem that really overwhelms all of us. And then there's another problem that's, that's uh, I think, uh, this, that helped exacerbate the situation is the glorification of the use of drugs and those kind of things that we see in the media. And I don't want to attack them because I think it is a problem that we all have to deal with. There has to be a balanced approach, and if we did not continue this effort, what you're talking about would be even worse if we didn't have the funds to deal with it on the suppression end. Uh, and even though we are combining it with education, prevention, and treatment in California, uh, it's just not enough to go around when, in fact, we're, we're giving the burden, I think, to many of those of us who try to handle all of it when we need to be bringing or forcing other people to participate. I think uh, the education program should start at the idea when people talk about getting married and before conception and it should never end. We wait till kids get here and then we're going to try to turn them around when in fact uh, we can't turn them around in 45 minutes a day even though we might give them a great dose of it at a school or any other kind of education institution. So there are a number of things we can do, but we can't eliminate. This is certain eliminating this program won't help that. I think again it would just exacerbate it. And uh, we need to, 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 I think, collectively, the administration, maybe they're trying to do that to force feed some of those things, but we need to make sure that that's done at the local level as well. Any other comment? Uh, I, I, think, I think the one thing that we need to, to remember is that what we do is a last line of defense, uh, and, and we're trying to hold that line until education and prevention is capable of handling and parents are capable of handling the education part of this. In the meantime, all we're trying to do is, is hold the line, protect society as much as we possibly can, and interdict as much of this as we can possibly do, while at the same time lending our support to the other areas. But it, it does have to be, it does have to be a multi-pronged approach if we're going to win this war, but we have got to have the resources to win. We struggle along. Everyone at this table can tell you we do with the very least that, that we can do it with, and, and we eliminate all of those that aren't the very best programs that are, that are working. And uh, we've got to have more resources in order to be able to go forward. And I think that the, jo the job that we have done has been tremendous, but we need additional support. There's no quick fix to this. We didn't get into this overnight. Mr. Pagel, do you have anything to add to that? Um, Mr. Johnson, you, you, um, your testimony detailed uh, a list of programs being funded by, by the burn program in California. Um, if the burn program is eliminated and changed, will, will each of these uh, grantees have to apply individually uh, to Washington for funding, or how will they pick up the funding for those programs? Yes, they would, and I think you probably heard this morning what you did not want to hear, that they, they probably won't be funded. I don't know that. When we say that these uh, small uh, communities have to compete for whatever the dollar amounts are, we know that they don't all have the ability to be able to do that. 
And I think the way we have it now, we ensure that all of these communities uh, receive some funds and that if, uh, if they need some technical assistance, we provide that. I don't know where that would come from if we eliminate this, the system that we currently have. Uh, I think what the administration uh, should have done and should do is they probably should have talked with us a little bit more before they devised this idea and we wouldn't be here today having to plead for the, uh, the uh, continuation of this fund. But I dread to think what might happen down in, in your area and when we know what's coming up 99 and in Interstate 5 with drugs and gangs out of the Los Angeles area. So it really would be a terrible uh, travesty. Uh, uh, Mr. Johnson, you think that uh, um, it, someone from the, uh, the Justice Department referred to, well, maybe some of them will be picked up by states. Um, how, what kind of likelihood is that? You can respond for California. Other people can respond for their own states. But well, that the state would, would pick up those, uh, those programs. I don't know. We know Texas is a large state. They might be able to pick up the portion that California wouldn't be able to. I don't want to tease him. Uh, no, California not. I think you know what our budget problems. For the three years, last three years, we've had a uh, deficit. Uh, it will continue this year. In addition to all the national disasters that I mentioned when I began my testimony, that has created an additional problem and drain not only the federal government but its state government. Uh, we have people leaving California, the revenue generators and many of the businesses. There is no way that we would be able to assume any of that at the uh, state level. Would that al not also change the way we have conducted uh, uh, in the past this war on drugs if, if you leave it up to state to state to fund these programs? I mean, we've had national war on drugs. And if you have a national war, you have some national um, tie together, uni uniformity or something. Uh, if now we say, well, maybe the states will pick it up, uh, seems to me you've, you've just changed the complexion of the war on drugs. You, you've left it up to states to, to, to pick it up. I mean, this is a national epidemic. It is a, should be a national priority. I mean, so I guess my question is, I mean, some states can afford it, some can't. Uh, so you changed the war on drugs. You, you, you have no uniformity across the country. Is this correct? Or? Well, I, they, there might be some, some national standard, but I don't know how it could be enforced if you don't have the, the people, the personnel in the states to do that. And that, of course, would create a, a problem, and that's what would happen. I mean, I would, end, I would lose the, the 11 people that I have in my uh, agency that deal directly with this fund. Uh, and I don't know who would pick it up at any other level. Uh, standardization and regulations to a certain extent is, is terribly important and I think we've done a lot of that and most of us talk about having big government in our in our homes in our deal there's a certain amount of I think big government standardization that's, that's necessary if we're going to to be able to attack this problem on on a uniform front and, and uniform does not mean that Wyoming cannot do it the way that Wyoming decides they want to do it and California would set up their own standards based on the needs of California and I must say, uh, I have to hate to repeat this, but we're different in many ways than a lot of the other states. I understand. I guess what I meant to say that it, at least it looked as though from a national level there was some leadership on trying to, to, to put some yes. uh, teeth in some national uh, drug uh, And program. we've appreciated the leadership that has come from the, uh, from the Bureau of Justice Assistance and direction that we've gotten that certainly has made us operate a, a lot better and a lot more efficiently in California. Uh, uh, Mr. Timmons, you, you testified uh, in a, a detailed way about your um, assistance uh, project to, to the jails in Alabama, and, and then just very briefly, uh, have you um, um, made your um, feelings known to the DOJ? I mean, have you asked them how now are we going to pay for, for this now that this is uh, going to be gone? Yes, sir. I, uh, we had a national church meeting three weeks ago up here when y'all had the Y'all invited the snow in for us and hit the blizzard, and we had to, couldn't get back out. But uh, Tom Foley came before the speaker did, and I talked to Mr. Speaker directly about it, and I talked to our delegation, too. Most of the delegation served with me in the legislature, including Chief Justice Heflin and uh, um, Richard Shelby. So I've nailed all them pretty, pretty heavily, pretty hard. because, And I've had to show them at a national level, uh, we have to come to Congress to look to y'all to stop the inflows from coming in from Columbia and other places. Because when it hits our soil, then we've got to take revenue dollar at the local level and try to, to combat it at that, that time, and we just don't have it anymore. It's just no money there. But we do know and recognize the fact that when family values are gone, well, then just a few weeks later, you're going to see social values gone, and that's what's happening to us today. As the gentleman from Texas said, it didn't happen overnight. It came in like childbirth. It came in like baking a cake, and it, now it's here, and we're going to have to reckon with it. 
and we can't afford to be losing this type of money that does come to local levels. Burn formula is one of the things that does come to local levels where we can utilize in the DARE program and drug abuse and also in my jails. <coughs> I'm overcrowded in all of my jails in the state and I'm under federal court order and the federal judge issued an order to release them. So on my business card now, I put official get out of jail card. I give it out to everybody around over the state where they won't be eating off of me when I put them in jail. Thank you, Mr. Timmons. Uh, just out of curiosity, uh, Mr. Foe, you, you made reference earlier to asset forfeiture laws and that you use part of that for your matching money. Do you have a Michigan state asset forfeiture law? Yes, yeah. we do. And what is the split on that? Uh, the money goes to the jurisdiction that seized it. 100 percent? 100 percent. You're not competing uh, with asset forfeiture laws in Michigan with mental health programs no. and other, so you no. clearly look goes to law It's 100 percent for law enforcement by statute so that those assets that are seized by these multi-jurisdictional drug teams go back for their operating expenses, which would include the match funds um, for okay. the grant. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stupak? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Wellborn, uh, we're talking a little bit about um, if we lost this money for our uh, multi-jurisdictional teams, where would the money come from? You said you had inquired of, uh, yes, sir. and you were told that there would be no money available then? Yes, sir. We were told that there would be no money available for our multi-jurisdictional drug task forces. Uh, uh, we also had the governor of Texas come up and, and discuss this uh, very recently within the last few weeks, and uh, uh, she went home with the same uh, with the same instructions that there would be absolutely no way that that our that our drug teams would be funded by this because this was going to be very rigidly. Uh, used uh, for community policing and it was not going to be available for our drug task forces. So either we here in Congress make a change in this policy or else uh, our basically our drug teams are gone. That is correct, sir. And you said you'd lose 95 percent of your drug teams? Yes, sir. We've got about 1,100 officers assigned to the Texas Narcotics Control Program. Out of that, about 600 of them are full-time paid officers. Uh, we have uh, uh, other officers that are assigned or donated to the drug task forces around the state, and uh, that makes up the 1,100 people. Our state police only have 120 narcotics officers. Without uh, the narcotics control program, uh, it it is a it is a shambles, and and we're talking about uh, an area where you're going to get so many drugs coming up, uh, even to your state through us. Well, since you offered to pay for California, I thought maybe you guys would help pay for Michigan, too. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. <laughs> uh, Mr. Johnson, how many of your uh, drug teams would be gone if, if, if these for funds were gone? Uh, probably one of the later speakers will be able to address that from DOJ. Um, I'm not certain. We have 39 projects, and the number in those, in those task forces vary, so I'm not certain, but the majority of them would, would be gone. How about you, Tom? Mr. Pago, how many would, would you lose in Wyoming, I know? We would lose, we would lose virtually 100 percent of our task forces as they currently exist. Uh, at the state level, we would lose manpower and would have to do some reorganization and, and put a token uh, effort out in each area. And I imagine with the economic situation with the various local departments, we might have uh, maybe at maximum a half dozen departments that could commit a man full time without this project. That would be the larger cities, I take it then? Uh, correct. Larger city, a couple of the larger cities and a couple of the counties with uh, high coal uh, uh, revenues. M Mr. T Timmons, on behalf of Alabama, how many of your drug teams would be gone if we lost the burn funds? The biggest majority of them on my local level at Mobile, I would probably maintain it in some way. I, I'd probably have to pull it out of pistol permit funds or Things. When I was in the legislature, I passed a lot of laws that give us some little bit of pulls on things that other folks don't have, and we will have to pull it out of that. Mine on the uh, uh, the rural areas where I've got some drug task force, they will fold because uh, they will not be able to stay in. I know there'll be 487 people I'll probably have to let go. Uh, my jail administrative program, I will implement it some way. I don't know right now how I will do it, but I will probably maintain it and keep Dr. Haley on staff to where I can keep, because that's where most of my 30 and 40 million dollar lawsuits are coming out on these 1983s, and I just, I've got to curtail that because the lawyers eat me up on that one. <laughs> so I've got, to, I've got to stay on it, but the uh, Mobile's my biggest. Now, I lean pretty heavy on, uh, on uh, 
the other federal agencies down there, whether it be the Coast Guard or what, for implementation too. So it's, I got an AT&F man that's retired, and so it's okay. pretty much I've been leaning on other folks, been learning how to, to borrow and beg. <laughs> Ms. Defoe, how many would Michigan lose of our drug tax? We would lose <clears throat> completely seven or eight drug teams. And then more importantly for us even is that the other existing drug teams would lose the additional counties. Um, we have uh, a number of them, of course, that are multi-county. Uh, at other cities, we would be reduced to um, major cities and maybe one or two surrounding uh, communities. But the ones that are that would continue would have some presence, but it would be so d reduced that it would have a significant impact, uh, as well as those in the uh, northern half of Michigan and the Upper Peninsula, which would be gone entirely, including our CAT team. So then like uh, Hunt, TNT, oh, Sane, Upset, mm -hmm. they would all be gone because That's they're right. multi-county jurisdictions? Yes, and okay. all of those uh, that are pretty much north of Grand Rapids would be gone. I, I know Michigan, uh, Mr. Full testified and Mr. Johnson testified that they hold uh, local hearings on how best to use the burn funds. Uh, do you do that in Texas and Wyoming and Alabama? Yes, sir. We, we held eight hearings across the state of Texas, large cities, small cities, all over the state, and, and that information was compiled, and we put together our drug strategy with that. So you do have a bottom-up review. I mean, the locals have all the input possible in burn funds. You, you bet. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all. Mr. Timmons, I'm going to ask you this question because it sounds like you've been around for a while, and... I kind of have too, a little bit for about 20 years in trying to deal with public policy. And I, there was a mention of the LEA, gr LEA grants that were around several years ago. One of the things that I'd just like to ask, and maybe from all of you, is particularly with the chairman's question about how we're hearing that drug-related crimes are going up. But how many times have we seen the system change in the last 20 years that's never allowed us to have that ability to to go from a point A to a point C until they pull the plug out from underneath us or the rug out? Well, uh, many times because uh, I'm 60, I'll be 62 years old in July, and I believe it turns around every 12 years, it looks like. Uh, we go through a cycle. I know all federal money is supposed to be looked at at the local level as seed money, and we're supposed to use it on a, used to it was a three-year phase out, and I believe the burn's a four-year phase out now. It's always been looked at as seed money for us to implement somewhere down the line. But before we get it, we get it started. But before we can put it into the uh, regular budget or at state level or county level, it's it's un it mushroomed into something that we can't afford, and we can't afford to do without it. So it's it's really a task that it just seems to recycle every time. It's always got something new. I'm just some, and as Mr. Johnson said, it seems like it always comes out of the birth of California, and they send it to us. The only thing they don't send to us is the earthquakes. <laughs> <laughs> but they send us everything else. But uh, I'm kind of scared about what next is going to be because when crack started out there, I went out and sent a team out to California to look at crack and see how well we could do with it. And I believe they rode the same plane back. Uh, when we got back, they were there with us. So it's just been a real mess. It just seemed like it's a cycle, and I guess that's what the Lord means to do to keep us on toes. We can send him some med flies. <laughs> <laughs> now, wait a minute. That's too close to Florida. We don't want med flies. Thank you. <laughs> Do any of the others want to? Yes, ma'am. I, I guess I, I would come, and if you go back to the old LEAA days, and, and there were a lot, there was a lot of good things done with that money. I went, I went to college myself on that, on that particular grant. But if, if you look at that, when there is, when there is not a continuation of funds, or if, or if there is not the suggestion even that there will be a continuation of funds. What you find are toys. You, you buy toys, you buy equipment. And I'm sure you can find departments in the country where there's still equipment sitting on a shelf someplace that was bought with LEA, excuse me, LEAA money. The, the difference that you're seeing, and when we talk about these task forces, you are talking about something that has been created and is ongoing and is producing. And, and I think that is the thing we have to look at here. This, this is not a one-time program that worked for six months or, or 12 months. This is an ongoing program that is producing and accomplishing, and, and that's critical. When you, when you say it's producing and accomplishing, do you have some statistics to offer to this committee to, to support that? I, I guess what I can show to you, ma'am, is, 
is I can show you what we had and what we were able to produce before and what we have done now. I am not suggesting that law enforcement or task forces are going to solve this problem. This is a societal problem. This is not a law enforcement problem. But if my, I, I guess I would offer to you that if, if these conditions exist today and now we are aware of them, they were existing before and we simply had not addressed them. So, so the significance of the problem, we now have a, at least a bit of a handle on that. Our efficiency and effectiveness continues to increase and, and hopefully the education and treatment efforts, those are our long-term answers, not enforcement. And for, we are a reaction, that's all we are, but we are a very necessary reaction. Well, I think what would be, would be helpful is because, yes, this is going to change. And I think as you have term limits and administration changes, this will happen. But it should be put in statute. I think some, uh, some uh, real intelligence and thought should go into when we start putting in the budget language and then when we put it in statute that will kind of make sure that we don't just chop things off because there's a change in administration. Uh, most of the staff people are around. You can... You know, your staffers were probably here when you came, and many of them will be that's here when you're gone. That's only been a year, so that's not a great history. Yeah, well, <laughs> but I think it's important that we think of it in that way. If we think this is a great idea today, then it should be a great idea tomorrow down the road, or there should be some uh, language will give you that flexibility as you move along, and not just abruptly say, now we're going to, we've used this enough, let's go to another system. And, and I think those of you at that, at, at there would have to help us in that regard. Thank you, Mr. Thurman. Um, any other questions? No, sir. We've been joined by uh, our colleague, Mr. Kyle from Arizona. You've heard part of this panel. Would you have any questions? He's going to introduce a member of the next panel. We appreciate very much you being here. You've been very generous with your time and your patience, and we appreciate it. Thank you. We'll take um, panel four, Mr. Dome, Mr. Dean, Mr. Carr, Mr. Blitz, Mr. Mulville, and Mr. Um, Albo. And if you remain standing, uh, we have a policy of swearing in the witnesses. Raise your right hand. I swear to tell the truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you very much for being here today, and uh, we're going to um, accommodate our colleague from Arizona, Mr. Kyle, who we're honored to have here today to make an introduction of a uh, constituent or someone from his state, uh, Mr. Albo, Mr. Kyle. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. As a member of the full committee, but not the subcommittee, I very much appreciate the opportunity you've afforded me to uh, sit in with you for a little while and to introduce uh, one of my former constituents uh, and a representative of the state of Arizona. I should also assure everyone that the uh, absence of Republicans from the panel is a reflection of the fact that beginning at 1 o'clock, uh, we are all in a meeting, except for me. So I will have to depart uh, as soon as I can to uh, attend that Republican conference, but I apologize for that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I certainly support your efforts in calling uh, uh, these hearings together and compliment you for uh, what you are doing here. And I would like to introduce uh, Joe Albo, who is the Executive Assistant for Criminal Justice Issues for the Governor of Arizona. He also, importantly, is a former county attorney for Gila County. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I used to represent Gila County, and I can tell you that it is in many ways typical of the kind of uh, more rural areas of our country that depend upon the funds that are the subject of your hearing and uh, have uh, not the kind of wealth that certain urban areas in our country might have. As a matter of fact, most of the land is federal land. It has a very low tax base. If I told you that about 3 percent of the land in this county is privately held and not all of that is subject to the tax base, that would be an accurate reflection of the problem that this county has. And Mr. Albo had to uh, work in that environment as the county attorney and also in an area in which uh, Arizona continues to be a major quarter for 
uh, drug uh, running from uh, south of our border. Uh, Joe Albo is also a former member of the Arizona Criminal Justice Commission. He now oversees the commission which decides where the Edward Burden funds are to be spent. And as I said, as a former county attorney, I think he knows firsthand how the Edward Byrne grant benefits Arizona's communities, and particularly the rural communities. So I think he has much to offer this committee, and I join you in welcoming him to the government operations. Thank committee. you, Mr. Kyle. We clearly understand you have a 1 o'clock meeting. It was our intentions to be finished with this hearing close to 1 o'clock, and we apologize. We're behind as usual. Well, so you've taken a lot of important testimony, and that comes first. Thank you. Mr. Albo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank uh, Representative Kyle for the introduction. Uh, I have uh, a printed um, statement that I would like to submit for the record. Absolutely. And uh, just go along to, to say that on behalf of Governor Symington and the state of Arizona, us too, we share all of the problems that you've heard about earlier today, um, things mentioned by Mr. Pagel, uh, Mr. Wilborn, and Artis Defoe about the problems that they experience in the, in the states that they represent, Arizona experiences to the same extent. Right now, the Edward Byrne Memorial State and Local Law Enforcement Assistance um, Formula Drug Grant provides $4.9 million to the state of Arizona for the task force program. The local agencies make up the balance, which is 51 percent, for a total of $9.9 .9 million. million. That balance is, comes from money that is seized in anti-racketeering activities at the local level and is used to make up the match. I know that, that you asked that question of earlier witnesses, and that's how we fund the balance of uh, these programs in Arizona. There are 15 counties in the state of Arizona, all of which are very large, only two of which can be considered urban. Those are Maricopa County, where Phoenix is located, and Pima County, where Tucson is located. The rest of us are all from smaller jurisdictions and have a difficult time and had a difficult time until uh, this program was established in 1987 in the state of Arizona. As Congressman Kyle mentioned, 97% uh, of the land in Gila County is owned by the federal government or is on uh, Native American reservations. The rest is, um, is concentrated in a few small populated areas. But we have significant drug problems in the views of those areas. I liken the problems that, that we had in Globe, Miami, which is the part of Gila County that I came from, to operations run by um, a pretty famous organization that I don't want to disparage, but our drug um, people were like Avon ladies. They would take orders, go down to Phoenix or Tucson, uh, pick up four or five, six hundred dollars worth of drugs, come back to Globe and Miami, <coughs> excuse me, Miami, make their deliveries in less than an hour, and um, they were users. And, uh, and sellers, they would um, use up the proceeds, go back to Phoenix and Tucson within uh, two or three days, pick up another four or five hundred dollars worth of drugs and come back. Without the ability of having task force members from all of the agencies in that county being able to, to follow these people, find them, identify them so that I could prosecute them, that activity would just have increased. Uh, we were able to send a number. Uh, into the prison system in Arizona. Arizona has a, a very um, tough sentencing policy that deals with drug sales, and, and we've been able to, to deal effectively with that. One of the greatest losses, uh, in my view, is having been a prosecutor for a number of years, would be in the, the um, slots that are lost uh, to the Department of Public Safety Crime Lab. That would lose, we would lose seven criminalists, uh, two fingerprint uh, examiners, as well as, uh, as another forensic scientist. And when you're waiting to get a case into court, the last thing you need to do is to, to have to go in a, up and ask the judge for a continuance because your evidence isn't back from the crime lab. Even though you may have two pounds of marijuana, you can't uh, prove that without the testimony of a criminalist. And the defense al always wants to know where are the fingerprints. So you need the fingerprint expert. All of these components are funded by this formula drug grant, and it works effectively in the state of Arizona. Um, if the formula drug grant is eliminated in Arizona, it won't be replaced by what's being proposed now. Out of all of the jurisdictions in the state, only one, the city of Tempe, has received funding for seven police officers for community policing. Uh, in, in the small communities, we've been doing community policing for a long time, but it's not the same as having dedicated task force 
uh, enforcement officers and dedicated prosecutors who are able to go out and do the work. If you chop the, the money off now, uh, you still have people in the system who are in, sitting in county jails. You have prosecutors who have to continue to prosecute these cases, and, and that will lag for some time after the, uh, the money is gone. So I appreciate the work of this committee, uh, the tenor of the questions that have been asked, and I would be glad to ask, answer any questions at this time. Thank you, sir. We, we appreciate your testimony and your patience in uh, being here this morning. Uh, I would like to yield to uh, Ms. Thurman from Florida, who uh, will introduce uh, uh, the next witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's an honor for me today um, to have our sheriff from Citrus County in Florida, who is one of the counties that I do represent. I've known uh, Sheriff Dean for, well, I guess we don't have to tell him, do we, Charlie? <laughs> for a long time, and we've worked together for a long time. He is the past president of um, the Sheriff's Association for the State of Florida, obviously was very active and involved with uh, the state system and, and legislation that uh, for uh, trying to get rid of some of our problems in the state of Florida. Uh, he's been recognized, I think, as one of the top crime prevention areas in, for his work in there. And more recently, he has been working with Governor Childs on the Criminal Justice Commission. Um, but I just appreciate the fact that he's taken his time out of, of what is a very busy schedule right now to kind of give us an idea of what happens in Florida and how the sheriffs are feeling about this particular piece of legislation or loss of it. And then I will say, Mr. Chairman, that we're going to have to leave because we have another thing to do at 1.30. Thank I'm you. Sorry. I, I understand that, and that's the reason we, we moved this around. And uh, I appreciate you being here very much, Sheriff, and we appreciate your time today as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Mr. Thurman. Mr. Chairman, uh, Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Charles Dean. I'm the sheriff of Citrus County, Florida. I've been privileged to serve for my county for 14 years as a sheriff and have been in public service for 30 years. I'm here to present information to you today on a very important federal program, one that has meant much in the fight against drug abuse, violent crime to me and to many other law enforcement personnel throughout the state of Florida and, to other, and other states, I'm sure. I refer to the Edward Byrne Memorial State a local law enforcement formula grant program created by Congress in the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 18, 1986 and amended and continued with the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1988. The Burn program is unique among the federal programs, uh, funding programs because of the high degree of flexibility it affords local governments. This flexibility allows the people who live with the problems caused by drugs and violent crime to design the solutions that will work best for them. This community-based approach to problem solving is visionary, and we in Florida are grateful to have the freedom to use federal funds in a way that are meaningful to us. The purpose of the Burn program, which is administered by the Bureau of Justice Assistance and the U.S. Department of Justice, is to provide state and local units of government with grant funds to assist in implementing projects designed to address the problems of illegal drug use, violent crime, and improve the efficiency effectiveness of the criminal justice system. Note, please, that I emphasize the term assist. These funds are often combined with other drug and crime fighting programs as a leverage of other funding. Specifically, the burn program use seeks to prevent drug abuse and to improve the ability of criminal justice agency to apprehend, prosecute, adjudicate, detain, and re rehabilitate drug law offenders. The application that each state submits for the burn fund goes to the Bureau of Justice Assistance and contains a statewide strategy for drug and violent crime control. In Florida, and probably in other states, the requirement for this strategy has fostered a level of cooperation that has greatly improved the efficient use of these funds at both state and local level. Funds are allocated by formula based on each state's relative share of the U.S. population, and each state must then dist distribute to its local units of government a portion of state grants fund. In Florida, 61.56% of the total federal award is distributed to local units of government. The remaining 38.44% is retained for state agency projects. In Florida, 61.56% local share is allocated to local units of government based on crime statistics and population figures of each of our counties. Units of government receiving these funds must provide cash matching funds equal to 25% of the total project cost. 
Subgrantees may use grant cash received under the federal asset seizure and forfeiture equitable sharing program or the state and local asset seizure and forfeiture funds to match the federal program federal funds. The program permits funding in 23 purpose areas, as you know. And these purpose areas range from prevention to adjudication to rehabilitation and a continuum of activities among and within. These purpose areas is critical to the success of all in each one of these programs. Among these purpose areas are drug demand reduction education, multiple jurisdiction task forces, immunity crime prevention programs, and rehabilitation and treatment of offenders, just to name a few. A complete list of these purposes I have attached and have available for you in our state. Of the burn funds received in Florida to date, 47.7% have been directed to rehabilitation and treatment. 29.3% to criminal justice and law enforcement, 10% to prevention and education, 4.2% to administration, 3.8% to innovative programs, and 3.0% to management information systems, and 1.7% to evaluation. Each subgrantee is free to apply for funds in the purpose areas and the areas that best meet their needs. And I'd like to interject at this point one of the big words I've heard since before I came to Washington is initiative. I think that shows initiative in the state of Florida. But subgrantees cannot act alone. Since the burn funds are intended for both the county and cities within the county, Florida encourages local units of government to form a sub substance abuse advisory board to plan for and make recommendations to the county and cities regarding which unit of government will receive these funds and the amount and purpose of the funds. When the applications are submitted to the state, letters of approval from at least 51% of the local units of government representing at least 51% of the population must be included. Although the money itself has been much needed resource, perhaps the most important impact of the burn program in Florida is the way drug and crime fighting efforts have been focused and institutional barriers broken down or moved altogether. The twin carrots of money and wide variety of purpose areas and allowable activities within the purpose areas has brought people into the same room that have been fighting alone for years. Not just within a criminal justice system, but also across disciplines, many people have finally realized that whatever they do affects the other players in the war against drug and crime. The number of community-based coalitions, advisory boards, neighborhood councils, task force that have sprung up as a direct result of the burn program is phenomenal. The people in these groups come together at first to receive funds, but then they stay together because the cooperation works better than non-cooperation and because of the flexible community-oriented approach that is so strongly encouraged in the burn program gives them the tools they need to address what really concerns them most, and that's about drugs. For example, the community crime prevention purpose area allows a variety of activities from community policing to neighborhood safety program campaigns to recreational programs, and if they choose to apply for community crime prevention funds, local governments are free to construct the mix of activities that feel that serve them the most and the best. At this time, five of the 186 grants in Florida involve community policing already. And these projects may or may not include community policing next year. It just depends on how they need their situation and how that is resolved. For example, in my county, a rural area that is rapidly becoming urban, our biggest drug problem was that of the street dealers were able to identify unmarked police units and figuring out who are undercover operations faster than they could be affected and put into use. We had limited personnel, we needed more surveillance, and we were losing effectiveness in the aspect of law enforcement because we had to reallocate the resources to conduct effective drug investigations continually. The chiefs of my two small cities, that's Inverness and Crystal River, and the county commission and I decided that what we needed was an urban enforcement project and we on our enforcement project came out of classification 21. We weren't forced to do a treatment project or to start a drug abuse resistance education project or as an institute community policing. Not that these aren't fine <coughs> purpose areas and we may decide to request funding f for them one day but it wasn't our need and we weren't able to ask for what we needed. Instead we used a program that best suited and fit our needs. I'd just like to wrap up in bre brevity, if I can, sir. I've heard a lot of questions and answers this morning, but as a county sheriff and a coastal sheriff in the state of Florida, 
I think one of the hats that I wear that someone asked somebody this morning, I'm the Department of, of Defense. There's nothing between me and the Gulf of Mexico. When I look back and I see some of the initiative and programs that have been put in force lately to meet, to meet one or just a few, the Blue Lightning effort in Florida, where we had cutbacks in that program where we understand now that the 3CI Center in Dade County has been taken out, which was a surveillance uh, program put on between the Coast Guard, the, the uh, Customs, uh, in, the, in the United States uh, military assistance program. That's, that's left our whole coastline vulnerable for, throughout the state because we had at least had the capacity to communicate and to survey through uh, the radar to see what was out there. The same way about the cut back in the Coast Guard and the Straits. I think when our programs that we're, we're talking about today in the Burns program are initiative and our local effort to get the job done, we can't the job's not going away, the task's not going away, it's being enhanced every day, and we, and we need more and more help. So uh, this is one area that has worked, has been successful, and I would certainly, and I'm here today to say from the, from the folks in Florida standpoint, we support the BURN initiative and the program that we have there, we'll to see it continue. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Sheriff. Um, I appreciate your testimony, and I know you, you have to, to leave uh, for another commitment. I, maybe I just a real, one real quick question to you. Um, you heard this morning the testimony from the Justice Department that some of these programs that may be worthwhile that we don't pick up, states will have the option to pick it up. How likely is it for your state, the state of Florida, to pick up these programs uh, uh, if, if they're not picked up by some other uh, supplemental program by the federal government? Well, the, the major source that we have in Florida to be able to get the grant program to be able to do our 25% share is asset sharing at the local. We're a little unique situation there in Florida as much as the local county sheriff or local police jurisdiction can retain those funds. 15% have to be put in direct program areas every year out of my asset sharing. But on the other hand, I can take the rest of those funds or part of those funds as necessary allocate them throughout, as I did through my Board of County Commissioners, but a joint participation of the two, only two police departments that I have in a county of 100,000 people. I was able to do that to be able to get the program forward. It wasn't that, I wouldn't be able to do it. We had $102,000 allocated in that one project we're having. Uh, 86,000 came from the federal level. We couldn't have done that. If th those programs are gonna be wiped out. There's no other source of money. So, so just, to kind of rephrase your, your answer is uh, it's not likely that the state would pick up that money because they have other responsibilities, obviously. No. Okay. That's okay. Mr. Chairman, and, and maybe to go a step further with it's the fine. answer to that um, is that the state legislature is in session right now with a big emphasis being placed on the prison systems and our jails because, of course, we're like many other states. We've got overcrowding. On top of that, though, um, in the crime bill, we also have this issue of these regional prisons that are being talked about and meeting that 85% rate, which is even going to take more money from our state legislatures to try to meet that criteria to be able to work within the crime bill as it is. And so they're, they're actually, to, to go a step further, there probably are no state dollars available because we're trying to meet other thresholds that might be handed down to us in, in, a, in an effort to you know, give us some tools at the state level in the prison overcrowding system. So there's a lot of other things that happen out there. Well, there's some of us here that are, have a great interest in stopping this uh, idea that uh, because we're running out of money here and we have to make choices that, right. that, you know, the alternative to that is state and local governments can pick it up. But we have to <laughs> clearly understand that states and local governments are financially strapped and the likelihood of them picking up these programs if they're worthwhile is null and it's just not going to happen. I mean, they do not have the wherewithal to make it happen. Sheriff, I appreciate you being here very much today, and you are excused. I understand you have another commitment. Thank you. Chairman, thank you. Mr. Doan, uh, Chief of uh, California Bureau of Narcotics Enforcement, we appreciate you being here today, sir, and I uh, hope you don't mind being introduced by the chairman. <laughs> uh, consider it an honor, California, sir. Thank we you. appreciate it. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I've um, what you might call a career narcotic officer. I began uh, in undercover drug law enforcement uh, 23 years ago as a drug enforcement agent trainee with the state of California and uh, worked my way through the ranks to my current position. So 
I, uh, I'm not sure how much intelligence I bring to your committee, but certainly you have a lot of experience. I'm representing today our Attorney General of California, Dan Lundgren, uh, representing myself, quite a few of the police chiefs, and uh, the California Narcotic Officers Association, which has 6,000 members of uh, active and retired narcotic officers. I'd like to thank you for allowing me to testify today and give you some insight from what I call the, the end user's point of view. And uh, I've made some, quite a few scratch marks on my notes today. I'm not going to go through the Attorney General's uh, presentation. You've already got that, and I appreciate you taking that under consideration. Um, after hearing my colleagues uh, and a couple of the panels today, I feel it's probably not necessary that I say things that I was going to, at least not all of them. Um, I would characterize it by saying that we're all singing on the same sheet of music, so I'll try a different verse. Um, I would just say this. The federal assistance to um, California's counter-drug programs have done something I think that's equally important to us in government as, as trying to positively impact the drug problem, and that has taught us how to work together. Uh, when I began my career, I was, uh, had the fortune of being thrown out of police departments uh, seeing departments that didn't work well together, uh, that distrusted each other. Um, and as the sheriff so accurately said just a few moments ago, it's put us all in the same room with the same purpose and the same funding. Uh, and that's a good, healthy environment from which we can learn from one another and uh, have a more well-rounded and coordinated operations. There's, I think, several accomplishments. That question was asked earlier, what have we accomplished? Um, speaking for California, uh, we started a drug task force program there in 1972 before the Edward Byrne Memorial Grant Fund, uh, but it, it was only two drug task forces because that's all the state or the counties could afford, uh, and they were pretty small. We expanded that to the current 39. I believe the question was also asked uh, how many of those would close, and my estimation is 29 at least of the 39, uh, and those are the ones that my bureau currently supervises. Um, we have two types of task forces in California, the regional task forces that operate within a given county that have state, local, and uh, sometimes federal officers assigned to them, and uh, special task forces and strike forces that deal specifically with clandestine drug laboratories. Um, California has the dubious honor uh, that Texas and Florida do. We have uh, some international boundaries. We have extensive coastline. We have big metropolitan areas interspersed with rural areas, and it makes us a, a ripe area for some um, unique type, types of drug problems. Um, I'm, I'm trying to answer some questions I heard come up uh, earlier. Uh, one was, what kind of accomplishments we, have we made prior to the drug grants coming into effect in, 19, in 1986? Um, the Bureau, our Bureau, which primarily does all drug laboratory enforcement in California, sees 88 drug laboratories. That's a significant number when you consider that each one of those drug laboratories can produce about 100 pounds a week of that drug. After the grant uh, process and when we were able to focus grant funds on a very specific problem that California had, uh, we increased our clandestine laboratory seizures up to an all-time high last year of 457 drug laboratories. Uh, this year we were able to knock that back and, th and think we're starting to show some effectiveness because we're down to 398. Um, that represents over 70 percent of all drug laboratories in the United States based on DEA statistics. It's a significant problem that's been addressed almost exclusively with the grant funds. We've been able to, um, my colleague uh, earlier mentioned we were able to initiate a program called SENS, a statewide integrated narcotic system. This is um, the absolute latest technology which um, I think refutes a statement that was made in the first, or excuse me, the second panel today, and that was that the grant programs don't communicate well or weren't intended to do so. Um, SIN's project is just that. It's an automated communication system that allows us to transmit data, um, photographs, case management information, surveillance photographs from one end of the state to the other in about four seconds, which enhances officer safety and communications and allows us to share our information, share our casework. We have regular meetings of that system, and we hope that with the help of the grant funds that we will get every drug task force in California online by the end of next year. Without the grants, there will be no task forces to put online. And I can tell you this, that a good portion of that project, which was originally started in Los Angeles County and is moving northward through the state, was funded uh, cooperative, cooperatively by the high-intensity drug trafficking areas, uh, 
my, my unit, the Bureau of Narcotic Enforcement, Edward Byrne Memorial Funds, and some Defense Department funding. So it, it, uh, once again, we've moved into task forces not only in our operations, but in the way we administer our own selves and the way we uh, tackle a new problem. We will task force on, on financial issues as well. Um, I can't talk about uh, Drug Enforcement in California without talking about the risk projects, the Western States Information Network, which is an integral part of our task forces, um, helps us communicate with between each other and the five Western States. They are our link to the uh, El Paso Intelligence Center and the National Drug Intelligence Center and uh, f just enhance the communications links that these programs have to coordinate and not conflict. In addition, not funded by federal programs, but just because I believe the enforcement community is very interested in prevention and treatment, there are literally hundreds of informal partnerships between our drug enforcement units and prevention agencies and treatment agencies. Schools, uh, I have officers who adopt the classroom uh, voluntarily of uh, grammar school children and spend one day a month with them. It's not part of any grant program, it's not part of anything, but it's a, it's a new era of partnerships that have developed and we'd like to see that stay intact. California also, about the time that the Edward Byrne Memorial Grant Funds became available, adopted a statewide master plan um, and the Governor's Office of Alcohol and Drug Programs, um, the Office of Criminal Justice Planning and the Department of Justice play an integral role in maintaining the California strategy, which one of the key elements is to um, make sure that we don't have duplication, make sure that we don't have conflict, or that we don't have cross purposes in our grant funding. All grants have to have multi-jurisdictional uh, programs and they must be multidisciplinary. Uh, I think some specific impacts in California that might interest the committee, as I stated earlier, 28 or possibly 29 drug task forces, most of which are in rural California counties, <coughs> will literally go away the day the funding stops. Um, the SINS project will go away to the extent that only the major metropolitan areas will be able to self-fund. Most of the rural counties will not be able to. My own bureau will thir shrink by 30 percent. Um, we will eliminate nine clandestine drug lab task forces. We will seize approximately 275 fewer labs. We will lay off uh, statewide at least 300 officers. Um, we currently carry a case backlog backlog of 500 major investigations that we can't get to with our current funding. And um, we know that elimination of our funds just in the Bureau of Narcotic Enforcement will eliminate about 800 drug cases a year. We uh, also believe that we will seize 2,000 less weapons per year. Just Now I'm talking only about the Bureau of Narcotic Enforcement, but you have to keep in mind that the county and, and city of Los Angeles together seized 30,000 guns uh, last year. A lot of those guns will not be seized. I, I heard a couple of points made this morning that I, I feel I absolutely have to respond to. And one was that uh, there was a, an increased uh, movement towards juvenile justice programs with discretionary grants. And while I don't oppose that and I think it's needed, I don't believe it's appropriate at the expense of, of the formula grants. Uh, I think people need to understand that we are not out there seeking out juvenile offenders or unfortunate people who become addicted to drugs. We spend the vast amount of our time and resources on Colombian cocaine cartels, major marijuana growing operations, uh, drug laboratory operators. Uh, we spend a lot of our time trying to track down and eliminate trends, much like uh, Michigan talked about methcathinone in their laboratories. Um, I believe they did stop a, a problem in the process and they sent us the information in cooperation. Um, we have an alarming trend in California right now of Hispanic nationals um, taking over the clandestine drug laboratory organizations. Over the last year, 75 percent of our drug labs are operated by illegal aliens and that goes from San Diego to the Oregon border. Oregon has also seen an increase in that, in the illegal alien problem operating the labs. Most of the states now have comprehensive uh, chemical precursor control laws, however the, the old heroin and uh, cocaine smuggling cartels are now in the clandestine laboratory business and they're smuggling their own chemicals from uh, Mexico. We have to have the cooperation of all agencies throughout California from one end of the state to the other if we're going to battle those things effectively. And the, and the grant program does that for us under the formula grants.
Um, I, I would also say this. I believe the Attorney General said in his letter, and I will say that we are avid supporters of community-based policing. Um, it works, but it does not work for all crime categories. In order for it to work, you must have a community. The drug dealers in California, and I would assume every other state in this country, do not observe the same geopolitical boundaries that we do. They observe none. They have no rules. Um, it would be foolish of us to put artificial boundaries on our efforts to try and catch them when they don't. Um, in terms of assets, uh, you would expect us to all ask for more money every time we come here, and we probably will. But when you compare our assets to the assets of the drug cartels, I would tell you that they are much better funded, more well equipped, and better armed than we are. And we have to try and do something to level the score. I have been to, I've had the opportunity to go to Wisconsin, Texas, Florida, uh, work with their program personnel in developing our own grants, uh, and we've shared our results with them. And I can tell you that um, yeah, I found it curious this morning that decisions could be made to eliminate a program with such nationwide acceptance and endorsement by law enforcement uh, when everyone I've talked to absolutely thinks it's the best thing that ever happened. And I'm going to conclude my um, testimony there, and I'd love to answer any questions you have later, sir. Thank you very much. We, we do have some questions for you, but we'll get let, finish the witnesses. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Carr. Mr. Carr, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Carr is the Chief Bureau of uh, Drug Enforcement, uh, the Chief of Bureau of, uh, of Drug Enforcement for Maryland State Police. We appreciate you being here, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about what we in Maryland feel really is the most successful drug and violence control program the federal government, at least in my recollection, has ever, ever produced. As you mentioned, I am the chief of the Bureau of Drug Enforcement for the state police, but I'm also speaking to you today on behalf of the uh, National Troopers Coalition and as vice chairman of the Governor's Drug and Alcohol Abuse Commission, uh, that body that administers the burn grant uh, program for the state of Maryland. I provide you with copies of my uh, testimony, so I'd like to take this time to expand on my uh, written remarks. First and foremost, like the others up here, I'm speaking to you as a practitioner. And by that I mean someone who works not only with law enforcement professionals every day, but also with treatment, education, and prevention specialists on a daily basis. And when the administration talked of abolishing the Byrne Grant Program, I immediately re had to reflect on the situation in Maryland as it was before Byrne Grant, at a time, and I'm sure these other gentlemen can echo my remarks, when there was no state strategy for drug and alcohol control, when there was no local strategy, when at best there was a disjointed federal strategy, and in Maryland there was no law enforcement agent agency that was focused on the drug problem. We did not have drug task forces. Through the Governor's Drug and Alcohol Abu Abuse Commission and the Burn Grant Program, we were provided a forum and the funding to bring everyone to the table to ha hammer out a meaningful blueprint for the state of Maryland and thereby ensure the needed services were provided to uh, all of Maryland's population, 4.9 million people. I don't think it's a question of how much money you spend. I think it's a question of how you spend that money. And in Maryland, through the Burn Grant Program, we've established a DARE program in every school district in Maryland. We now have 16 task forces serving our 23 counties across the state. And these task forces are, are, are staffed with local prosecutors, state police, local police, sheriff's department personnel. They're co-located and co-managed and, and funded almost entirely through the burn grant process. So if we learn, lose the burn grant, we will lose our major impetus in Maryland for drug enforcement. <coughs> I might add that they also are not just limiting themselves to undercover operations. They get involved with the schools. I heard the gentleman talk about the Adopt-A-School program. One of our task forces gives out scholarships to graduating seniors who have done work in either drug or alcohol prevention in one of the counties. We also have some innovative programs and diversion programs that are jail-based, something that only the Burn Grant program has provided for us. And they mentioned earlier about statewide intelligence. Um, we applied for a uh, discretionary grant and uh, were unable to get it to establish a statewide intelligence system. So we use burn money, forfeiture money, and our own state general f fund monies. We now have a uh, statewide intelligence system. Well, really, it's an interstate intelligence system because we do the, the pointer index system for uh, Virginia, Maryland, West Virginia, and District of Columbia, and we're soon uh, be enhancing that system through the height of funds to really be a truly comprehensive statewide intelligence program. We also got involved in community policing before the, the, uh, the phrase became so popular, and we had some demonstration projects that were funded with the Burn program. 
Personally, I'm, I'm proud of the Bureau of Drug Enforcement, which was created in response to this need for a lead agency in the state of Maryland to do drug enforcement. In 1985, before Byrne, we had 35, police, 35 troopers uh, throughout the state doing drug work, and that doesn't work well in a population of 4.9 million and when you have major metropolitan areas like PG and Montgomery counties and Baltimore. Uh, now we have over 200 personnel, uh, both police and support personnel, married together in the task force concept, and we are involved in not only drug enforcement, we also provide training. In fact, in the last two years, we've trained over 17,000 police officers and private citizens, uh, including police officers from as far west as Missouri, as far south as South Carolina, as far north as Maine. We also have a very unique body on policy development in Maryland called the State Office of Strategic Drug Enforcement Coordination, which is composed of law enforcement executives, uh, managers, prosecutors, National Guard personnel. I haven't heard anyone talk about National Guard, but they certainly have been an integral part of our, of our drug fighting efforts. Federal, state, and local police officers. We meet monthly, we discuss policy issues, we resolve any, any problems between the agencies, and together I think we've really forged a partnership that, that uh, hopefully will, out, will, will last even though the burn funds may dry up. Uh, I might also add that our Bureau has done so well, we've been asked to go to the uh, country of Estonia next week to help them establish their drug policy efforts and, and drug enforcement efforts. In Maryland, we've been careful not to overlook our cities. As you know, the Burn Grant Program re requires a 25% cash match. Many times, our cities cannot come up with this match. Cities like Baltimore, which are in dire need of uh, drug funding. In Maryland, what we did was we, we overmatched. We provide extra state money and use that as the match money to allow Baltimore City under the Burn Grant Program to receive $4.1 million worth of benefit of new programs. In fact, today is the first day of our drug court that starts in Baltimore City, so we're very proud of that also. You know, throughout the testimony, uh, uh, and throughout, I should say, throughout Maryland, we've heard nothing but positive responses about the Burn Grant Program, and I haven't heard one reason why the burn grant, burn grant program should be eliminated at this hearing. It works, and I, I might add where it doesn't work, and if it doesn't work, the uh, uh, Bureau of Justice Administration has the authority to go out and make those corrections. I think it'd be a good question to ask them what they've done to correct the problems. By replacing one system with another, if you're not going to administer it properly, neither system is going to work well. I don't think we need a new program. I think Byrne has worked well where the, where the people have paid attention to it. And I also think, as M Mr. Chairman, as you pointed out, that it is bottom-up management. I really would take exception to some of the remarks I heard this morning about uh, Dr. Lee Brown being characterized as perhaps misunderstanding the action here. I know Dr. Brown, and I, while I haven't discussed this particular program with him, I don't think he misunderstood. What I understand, I think you, you do and, your, and the committee members do as well, when you talk about having 300 more hires at the federal level, you're not talking bottom-up management, you're talking top-down management. We do not need more cookie-cutter operations. What works in Wyoming, what works in California may not work in Maryland, and what works in Maryland may not work in those states. What we need is what we have <laughs> under burn, the opportunity to sit down and do individualized planning that meets our needs and to together hand-in-hand hand, implement those programs, and that's what the Burn Grant affords us. I, I thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to speak with you today. I would also, if you don't mind, like to be excused. I have a meeting in Northern Maryland at 3.30, and I don't want to have to speed to get there. I, I clearly <laughs> understand that, and given the weather, I, I understand that. I appreciate your excellent testimony and your patience. Uh, I know you had to wait a great deal to give that testimony, and I appreciate it. it it's uh, been a great service to the committee. So I, I, you're excused, and I appreciate you being here very much, thank Mr. You, Carter. Sir. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, the, the last two witnesses of this panel, and um, the Honorable James uh, Mulville, Mulville, Assistant Attorney General, uh, Director of New Jersey Division of uh, Criminal Justice, and the Honorable Jeffrey Blitz, um, Atlantic County Prosecutor, uh, President of the County Prosecutors Association of New Jersey. We're delighted to have uh, both of you here. Uh, Mr. Mulville, you want to... Thank you very much, uh, Congressman. Very pleased that you... Uh are holding this hearing today. Uh, I am here with uh, Jeff Blitz. Uh, we are speaking on behalf of Attorney General Deborah Poritz, uh, our, our 21 county prosecutors, and our entire law enforcement uh, community in New Jersey in opposition to the proposed elimination of the Burr Memorial State and Local Law Enforcement Assistance Formula. Uh, since 1987, the Burn 
formula grant program has provided crucial and much needed revenue to New Jersey's war on drugs. The proposal by the administration to terminate the program next year will have disastrous effects on New Jersey and other states. It will mean the loss of approximately 404 positions statewide, as well as critically needed equipment and other resources. And in New Jersey, of course, we have a very uh, unique system where our Attorney General is the Chief State Law Enforcement Officer, and our County Prosecutors are uh, the County uh, uh, Chief Law Enforcement Officers. And the cornerstone of uh, our strategy, which goes back to 1987, and has been really hand in hand with the Byrne Grant Fund uh, are our county uh, multi-jurisdictional task forces. Uh, Prosecutor Blitz is going to tell you about uh, his particular task force, which is one of our most outstanding ones. And it really is that our task forces are the jewel in the crown in terms of our uh, war on drugs. And drugs have such a, a, uh, a pervasive uh, effect uh, or, or uh, influence on all crime uh, in our st in New Jersey and in all of our states, and uh, our we have like 90 positions in our county narcotics task forces, uh, over four million dollars, another million and a half uh, or more in other expenses, and we have other ex uh, positions at the state level. If we lost those monies, it would be a real crucial blow to our uh, successful efforts. To, to combat uh, the drug problem and keep the pressure on uh, uh, in New Jersey. We are uh, doing a great deal in the community policing area. We're spending uh, uh, more money on community policing under the Byrne formula than we are on our multi-jurisdictional task forces. And we're doing that uh, in a gradual, uh, measured way in various cities. Uh, on an experimental basis, and it's, 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 uh, it's going very well. But it permits us to do this uh, in a, a balanced way, a uh, balanced response to crime, which involves many different programs, strategies, and disciplines. And we're not relying upon one, any one strategy, but a combination of strategies to, to uh, deal with uh, the problem of crime. Uh, it's, it, I think that uh, people must recognize it's not simply possible to uh, address the larger crime problem without specifically addressing the drug, drug epidemic. And uh, as I indicated, a large percentage of property and violent crime are drug related. Uh, each state has and is, has developed a coordinated response to crime by means of a mechanism to avoid wasteful duplication of services. Uh, this is what we have been doing in New Jersey, and this is what we've been doing under the, uh, the Byrne Formula Grant Program. State governments, rather than the federal government, are uniquely suited to develop a statewide strategic law enforcement spending plan, which is tailored to meet local needs, resources, and enforcement opportunities. And if we lose the Byrne uh, Grant Program, then we're going back to the discretionary funding where there's no coordination and there are just grants given out discretionarily to various uh, 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 law enforcement agencies without uh, coordination. And that's happening now under the community policing grants that are being given out in New Jersey without any coordination uh, with the, the Attorney General or the county prosecutors. And uh, we have state funds going for community policing as well, and we don't have that coordination because of the way that money is distributed uh, from the federal government. The Congress must take steps to ensure a certain degree of stability in providing federal grant funding so as to promote long-range strategic planning. The federal government should thus avoid sudden, unwarranted policy shifts, which this would be, uh, which will result in reduced financial support for those state, county, and local programs and strategies which have proven to be effective and which should be continued and institutionalized. So in sum, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, we have submitted uh, uh, an executive summary and um, extensive statement, a lot of exhibits, and we'd be happy to answer any questions you may have or sub submit additional information, but uh, we are vigorously opposing this change 
in, in the uh, elimination of the burn uh, program. Thank you very much. Mr. Blitz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm the prosecutor from one of those rural counties, at least as rural as I suppose that we get in New Jersey. My county has 230,000 people, uh, encompassing about 600 square miles, divided into 23 municipalities, ranging in size from Atlantic City, which is 37,000 people, to as small as Corbin City, which is about 400. Of those 23 municipalities, uh, six don't even have their own local police department. The size of the, of the various police departments, excluding Atlantic City, range oh, from a low of 10 officers to a high of 61 officers. The crime problems that exist throughout my county are similar to most other rural and suburban type counties, especially those located uh, well, within 100 miles or so of major metropolitan centers. In my county, there is no police department outside of Atlantic City that is able to devote full-time police personnel to the investigation of narcotics cases. All municipalities except Atlantic City uh, rely on the county-wide narcotics task force to provide expertise, uh, resources, investigative personnel, and a variety of other support to conduct drug investigations in their jurisdictions. The response of the uh, narcotics task forces has been so enthusiastic uh, that the local municipal police departments, except for Atlantic City, have all but eliminated uh, their own special narcotics bureaus in favor of active participation in the county task forces. In fact, it would be grossly inefficient uh, for any small or medium-sized police department having a manpower of less than 60 officers to try to create their own full-time narcotics bureau. Uh, they have neither sufficient manpower uh, uh, and officers to assign on a full-time basis. They don't have sufficient money for undercover drug operations or sufficient money to pay informants. Uh, they don't have jurisdictional authority outside their own municipality. They don't have intelligence officers to provide necessary seed information to narcotics units. They don't have specialized equipment necessary to successfully prosecute the cases once the defendants are taken into custody. They don't have undercover officers that are unknown in their, in their own municipalities, and I could go on and on. Uh, the bottom line is that narcotics enforcement uh, that is directed to drug dealers and their co-conspirators in New Jersey is run primarily by the officers assigned to the multi-jurisdictional narcotics task forces. It is these task forces that are funded by the Burn Formula Grant Program. It is these task forces that would need to be disbanded or reduced if the program is discontinued. Uh, my task force, which is similar to the task force in the other 20 counties in New Jersey, uh, is made up of about 20 officers, uh, some from my office, some from the local police, and some from the county sheriff. Should the grant formula funding be withdrawn, my task force, as well as the other 20 in New Jersey, would probably have to be disbanded or reduced unless additional funding would be provided either by the county or the state, uh, which, quite frankly, is unlikely. Um, I, I can't urge enough, and I speak as a prosecutor that has been involved in the prosecution of criminal cases and the uh, director of narcotics task forces and other operational units for 26 years, that if uh, this burn money is lost, it will be a crucial blow to the drug effort in the state of New Jersey. Thank you, Mr. Blitz. Uh, I want to thank all of you uh, uh, for your testimony today. You've, you've done an excellent job, and we, we certainly appreciate it. And uh, I, I know that you've had to wait a long time to, um, to make your statements, but I want you to know that they're appreciated and they're very helpful, I think, in uh, coming to a conclusion that's hopefully um, uh, some sort of compromise or consensus that, that, that everyone can uh, live with. I, I do have just a couple questions. Hold you just a couple minutes longer. Um, uh, maybe Mr. Doan or, or Mr. Blitz both, uh, anyone who wants to comment to this can, but I direct it to them. Um, it is my observation over the years, and I have a background of, of local government as well, and watch the formation of these, these multiple jurisdictions come together and, and watched over the years the difficulty in getting building trust between jurisdictions and, and uh, territorial concern and uh, expertise concern. And it appears to me over the years we have developed a, uh, a program by which you've got you know, dozens of agencies working together with very little friction and very little overlapping and, and very little uh, uh, animosity toward e either, um, uh, either department or, or jurisdiction. I mean, you, you, at least where I come from, they rotate the head of, of the, uh, the task force uh, periodically and so on and so forth. It's worked out. And, 
and it, but it's taken, and if I'm incorrect about this, please correct me, because I'm, I'm looking just as an observer and, and one who helped allocate money on a local level for these task force. Um, it, it appears that it's, it did take some time to do that, to, come, to work a system that, that just the jurisdictions themselves could feel comfortable with each other, that, that they weren't going to be shortchanged when it comes to um, uh, patrolling or, or at least oversight of their particular area. The point I'm making is now we're going to change this. Do you, uh, uh, do, do, do you think that we're going to go back to the possibility, go back to uh, if we're out competing in a different kind of program, we're going to have to go back and redo all that again, or, or have we already built that trust factor and, and at least whatever program that uh, substitutes this or comes in to, to fill the gap, we won't have to worry about this. I'd, I'd like to comment on that. Um, I think you'll see an almost necessary immediate reversion back to the old way law enforcement did business almost out of necessity because, uh, first of all, you'll see funded positions go away, so there won't really be anybody there to do that combined work. Uh, but secondarily, uh, in the what I like to call the dark old days when we competed for cases, uh, for notoriety, for media attention, for assets, uh, it took a long time, you were correct, sir, in, in developing trust, developing the administrative subsystems that will allow a task force to run as a separate entity apart from all of its parent agencies. Um, allow the, the formulation of all the legal documents and the memorandums of understanding that allow asset sharing, that also ensure that each of the jurisdictions within a given area that that task force serves gets its equal share of, of the resources so they get good drug enforcement services. Those things take, a, a, I'd say, a good two or three years to develop into what we would call a mature task force that operates at peak capacity. Um, and. Uh, Without the people, without the assets to do it, um, they will be forced to going back in and taking care of, care of their own provincial need uh, for their own agency. And I'm sorry, I think your statement is absolutely correct. Mr. Blitz, you... Yeah, I, I would share that. Uh, actually, I, I think it is, it is even more regrettable. The smaller municipalities that do not have the manpower to devote to um, a drug activity, yeah. um, I don't know what they will do. They will have to rely uh, on my office. Um, but without the multi-jurisdictional task forces, uh, the smaller municipalities are the ones that are really going to suffer. I, f I found that so at, in the beginning of all this, the small uh, municipalities or counties, small counties, might have resisted participating in this because maybe it's a few thousand dollars or what have you, and thought about doing their own, getting their own office or one officer or whatever. And I think over the time, we have convinced almost everyone that, that this is in the best interest that we go in with these task force and have these multiple agencies. And so I, I think you're right. If we go back uh, now, uh, uh, small communities are, are going to be hit extremely hard. W uh, the, can you tell me just a little bit about, and so, you know, I, I have some idea, but so for the record, uh, d just briefly, one of you or a couple of you describe uh, the, the input local uh, jurisdictions have in putting together the state plan. I mean, how do you go about doing that? How, how do you get everybody on board and participate in that? Well, uh, in California, for the, the state master plan and the, the spending plan for, the, for uh, Mr. Johnson's shop, um, there is a, uh, an executive working group made up of uh, sheriffs, chiefs, probation officers, uh, district attorneys, uh, representatives from the attorney general's office. So they try and cover the whole criminal justice and some of the treatment and prevention realm um, at the executive level to make policy decisions on, on uh, what kind of funding criteria there should be, uh, what kind of parameters that a, a new program or an existing program has to match to meet one of the 21 defined um, sub-program areas. Do they take in consideration, we heard this morning the Justice Department talk about greatest need, and uh, do they take in consideration uh, uh, the flexibility of, of, of crime to move around, I mean, you know, if you go into Los Angeles, you may have a problem there for a while, but what happens is they disperse once you clamp down there. Does your state plan take that in consideration? It does because each year uh, you, when you submit your uh, quarterly progress reports on that grant, and they're very strict performance uh, qualities in, in all those programs, um, you have to show what your performance level was. And if, if the need is, is no longer evidenced by good performance, then there, that's a clear indication that there needs to be a fund shift to another area. Uh, and each program identifies new problems each grant year that they submit their 
their request. So it's a, there's an ongoing uh, evaluation process of every one of those programs. Anyone else want to comment to that? Yeah, Congressman, Mr. we do an annual needs assessment and uh, get input from all uh, segments of law enforcement community and the, uh, the larger community. Uh, our Attorney General meets quarterly with our uh, State Chiefs Association leadership, president, executive board, and monthly with our county prosecutors. And basically all the policy in New Jersey is done on a collegial basis uh, with our prosecutors and police in terms of setting state policy and the prosecutors in turn uh, establish uh, county policy with their police chiefs. Uh, so we, we do this with, with this program as well as uh, on a regular basis. Mr. Albo, did you want to comment to that, sir? Um, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. The Arizona planning is done through the Arizona uh, Criminal Justice Commission, which is by law made up of police chiefs, sheriffs, county prosecutors, members of uh, county boards of supervisors, the courts, probation staff, as well as members of the public appointed by the governor. Public hearings are held uh, throughout the state on a periodic basis. Uh, we did produce uh, last year the 1994 strategy based on that planning process and we're in the, in the process of developing the, the 95 strategy, but it, it takes into, into account all of the needs um, in the state of Arizona and as things change, uh, and crimes change in Arizona, then uh, funding has shifted to, to try to compensate for that. Do any of you have actual experience uh, with applying for discretionary uh, burn grants? Uh, and if you do, is, is the process acceptable? I mean, you find things move in a timely fashion or is there a problem there? We, we have uh, successfully obtained a couple of uh, discretionary grants, but we have viewed them for a s completely different purpose than the formula grants. Um, formula grants were for an ongoing program with, with personnel years attached to it uh, and, and should be almost like a complete program package. We looked at discretionary grants to buy tools of the trade, uh, to buy clandestine lab response vans, uh, to uh, an, something with a very short begin-end cycle because they were usually on a year basis rather than three. So they were to buy so, good so goodies. So you didn't have to count on the money for operating. Right, and they, and they specifically excluded, I think, construction funds and that kind of thing. So they weren't uh, conducive to a, an entire program approach. Was the process uh, in receiving those funds acceptable? Uh, any hitches in it at all? Under those circumstances it was. I, I have to say, though, I wouldn't want to put all the formula grant programs for California on the line under that system because I think it's going to be way too cumbersome if you have the number of requests going to Washington uh, to BJA. You'll need those 300 people they talked about. Declare. With that number of requests, you might well, yes. Anyone else care to comment to that? Um, Mr. Abo, you stated that 51 percent of the total burn effort in Arizona is provided by state or local sources. Uh, uh, maybe you can comment, uh, have you elected to exceed the 25 percent match program uh, and are you aware, I think Maryland indicated that they go beyond the match of 25 uh, percent? Well, yes, the, the, the match provided by the local agencies is, um, is over half the grant funding. So we do uh, provide that from local and, and state sources. And all of that comes basically from uh, money seized in anti-racketeering activity and placed in the county or the attorney general's funds. In addition, that money that comes into those funds helps fund a lot of the um, education and treatment programs that operate in the state, and, and those would dry up if, if these task forces weren't able to generate that money um, to help them also. So, so the, the task force actually generates the revenue by which you can come up with more than the match fund? That's yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Doan, I have one final question, uh, and I, this is for the record. How many jurisdictions in California are involved in the task force funded by the Burn program? Uh, could any or all of them continue to participate in the program if the program was eliminated? I believe there are, uh, I believe there are 39 of the county jurisdictions um, that, that have county-wide programs, uh, and I believe OCJP does have several others that they administer from the state level. I don't have those right before me. Um, I, I just can tell you that I've talked to a number of the, the program staff from those task forces, and they simply cannot afford to continue them. A lot of them will fold. I think around 28 or 29 are going to fold. Okay. 
Well, that concludes um, uh, my questions to you. And once again, I, I want to tell you that I appreciate very much you being here. I know being the last panel, you have to wait a long time, but it, it was worth it for us to have you here, and I hope it was worth it for you. And uh, we appreciate it. We may get back to you with some additional questions and hope that we can expect a response. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, that, con uh, that concludes the meeting. The meeting's adjourned. The House Subcommittee on Information, Justice, and Transportation met Wednesday on Capitol Hill to consider law enforcement grants. Testifying before the committee were Democratic Congressman Robert Wise of West Virginia and Deputy Attorney General Kathleen Kennedy Townsend. This weekend on C-SPAN, Saturday, America in the Courts will feature an interview with Republican Senator Arlen Specter of Pennsylvania. He's argued before the U.S. Supreme Court in a case involving procedures to close military bases around the country. That segment will run at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, Saturday. Sunday, we'll have an hour-long books notes discussion with Nathan McCall. At 8 p.m. Eastern, then at 8 p.m. Pacific, he'll tell us about his recent book, Makes Me Wanna Holler, A Young Black Man in America. Also on Sunday, Road to the White House will feature President Clinton in a recent Oval Office interview. We'll also hear from former Defense Secretary Dick Cheney as he speaks in New Hampshire. And former Vice President Dan Quayle will address a group at Indiana University. Road to the White House, Sunday at 9.30 p.m. Eastern, then 9.30 p.m. Pacific, here on C-SPAN. At City Hall in Macon, issues facing his administration. The first mayor of Macon was 1826. And uh, we've had mayors uh, since that time. Of course, May, uh, Macon was a planned city.